Recorded at Medicines from the Earth in June of 2016. For more information on our conferences, lecture notes, books, and recordings, visit our website, botanicalmedicine.org. So I'm going to just go ahead and jump right into uh, hydrochloric acid because hydrochloric acid is one of those really important compounds that the digestive tract really depends on. Hydrochloric acid. So we've got in, inside our gastric mucosa, this is really, and especially in this, we're talking about the stomach here, um, parietal cells in the stomach make hydrochloric acid. They produce it in response to the stretch in the esophagus, the cerebral digestion we talked before. And once the food hits the stomach, it starts to you know, produce more hydrochloric acid. We talked about the Chinese idea, which was stomach fire, the fire of the stomach to digest the food, to burn it up into smaller bits. Hydrochloric acid is that fire. Okay? It's driven by the proton pump. That's the, the uh, hydrogen potassium AT pace. And it's stimulated by histamine. Someone just told me that water stimulates histamine. And histamine's kind of gotten a bad name, but histamine is actually a critical piece of the production of serotonin. It's the histamine, the histamine stimulation that leads to the production of the serotonin in our gut. And the histamine actually has a huge role to play here in producing the hydrochloric acid, which is a primary signal for the entire gastrointestinal tract. Everything in the, is interconnected and interrelated. So when the hydrochloric acid output is full and strong, then everything else down the stream is full and strong, or more so at least. So with the stimulation by histamine, you're activating the histamine receptor on the parietal cell, producing hydrochloric acid. There's another cell. We talked about the enterochromaffin cells. Those are the cells that produce the serotonin. We have another cell called the enterochromaffin-like cell which is acting in response to stimulations from the adrenals, from the, the stomach, and it's, it's the one that's acting to produce hydro, the, uh, the stimulation of the parietal cell via the histamine. So histamine is very important. You know, we often use antihistamines a lot, and in medicine there's a couple different ways to inhibit some of the gastric problems, and we're going to hit those a little ways down the road. Um, antihistamines are one, and proton pump inhibitors are another one. So these are targets of those digestive problems. So what does hydrochloric acid do? Well, it digest, helps us digest our food, obviously, but it also controls bacterial and fungal growths and also parasites. So it's an essential barrier for us. It prevents us from getting sick. So hydrochloric acid, though, is also, you can see here, it doesn't act very strong on its own on proteins, but when you combine it with pepsin, you get this incredible pure digestion of the protein. So these fundic pits inside the rugae of the gastric mucosa in the stomach have this deep trough. And at the bottom of the trough, the chief cells release pepsinogen, which is the deactivated form of pepsin. That pepsin, pepsinogen goes up through the, the pit towards the parietal cell. The parietal cell, stimulated by histamine, releases hydrochloric acid, which then activates the pepsinogen to become pepsin. And then the pepsin and the hydrochloric acid together out inside the, the stomach in the lumen digest the food. There's also the gastric juices um, that contain the goblet cell mucus as well, which creates the stomach lining that protects the stomach from digesting itself even more. So H. pylori is something that we're seeing a lot of. You guys see it a lot these days? You know, people are always talking about coming to the clinic, oh, I got diagnosed with H. pylori, I got H. pylori. And it's a very common thing to see right now. And Recent research says that about half of the world's population carries H. pylori, whether it's an overt infection or if it's just a part of their biota that's not established here, but we know that it's in a lot of people, H. pylori, and it generates a persistent immune response in the host, causes inflammation at the gastric mucosa, and leads to malignant transformations, cancer. I've seen a lot of stomach cancers that were in folks who had gastric problems induced by H. pylori, and also Barrett's esophagus is another one, too, where the acid problems are causing damage to the, esophagus, the lower esophagus, leading to cancers there as well. So hydrochloric acid is going to be one of our primary preventive measures to keep H. pylori from finding a place to live. 
because it hates H H HCL. It doesn't like hydrochloric acid. It kills the bugs. So you've got to increase hydrochloric acid in people oftentimes to get them to control the microecosystem. But you also have to be careful because you have to make sure that their lining is strong so that hydrochloric acid doesn't damage it. We're going to talk about that therapy later on in the talk. This, this is diagnosed with the stool sample or the breath test. Um, I think that the stool sample is a great way to go. It's, it's a really um, accurate way to go with diagnosing H. pylori. What's the breath test? It's another test. It's, I think it's um, might be methane. I have to, I'd have to re... No, I, not with H. pylori, I don't think. I think, you need to, I think you need to get a more specific test. I'm sorry, I don't have the answer on that one. It's the, um, the H. pylori breath test I'm not as familiar with, but the um, like yeasts, when people have yeast overgrowth or SIBO, definitely you can, you know, the small intestine bacterial overgrowth, you can get more of a sense of like, whoa, a lot of fermentation happening. And the, they have a hydrogen breath test for that. So leaky gut, we've hit this a couple times. This is, a, um, this is an image from a confocal laser endomicroscopy study here. Uh, the confocal lens emits the light out and then also receives the reflected image back. And you can see these are the, the crypts here. There's a bigger diameter here. Um, you can see how things are kind of opening up between the cells. It's just not well established. Um, leaky gut is this thing we've been talking about. I showed, showed you kind of like some of the, the earlier ideas that I had uh, in earlier in the talk that showed that there's a space opening up between the luminal cells of the epithelium of the intestines. And this is just looking at it under a microscope. And this is kind of how it's officially diagnosed in most people, is you use a confocal laser endomicroscopy, go up with the little tube into the intestines, and then actually look at the intestinal wall and be able to determine whether this person has leaky gut or not. And that's sort of the gold standard right now for the diagnosis. So tight gap junctions we talked about, we're looking kind of right here. This, you know, again, we're down into the villi here and the single layer of cells. Right down here, you can see there's an image. These are the cells. These are the microvilli on the cells. These little places here, these are the tight gaps. These are the tight gap junctions, okay? The tight gap junctions have control by small proteins, the occludins and claudins and some others now that are small protein molecules that are connecting the cells together. There's also kind of a filamentous action, kind of like a muscle action, like, like the myosin and actin in the muscles. It acts that way, too, to help control the gap between the cells. And that is basically regulating what can come into the intestinal epithelium and what can't. That's why I talked about sort of the second brain or the first brain having its gut-brain barrier, or I'm sorry, its blood-brain barrier, similar to the brain itself. What's being let in and what's not being let in. And, of course, things that disrupt this... Um, are things like, that cause inflammation. A lot of inflammatory processes, when they get out of control, will lead to problems at the tight gap junctions, causing the leaky gut, which then allows compounds that weren't supposed to be in the bloodstream. Because imagine, there's also capillaries running right along here, right along here. If we go back here, you can see these little capillaries drop in, and they're right along these single cells. There's a the line of capillaries, both venous and arterioles, that run right underneath those cells, and there's an interchange happening that's very direct. And so when these spaces open up and materials and even bacteria, viruses, things get through here, they enter the bloodstream. And then the immune system has to deal with them in the bloodstream. And dealing with things in the bloodstream is very different than dealing with them out of the bloodstream, out of the body. Remember, this, this, this area, the lumen here, is not in the body. It's out of the body. It's just through the system. It's the tube inside. So here we have a nice image. Here's, here's a healthy gut mucosa with this mucus layer being nice and thick, a good control on the bugs and the metabolites here. You can see here you've got the stem cells and you've got some enterocytes. These are the cells along the lining. You've got these uh, goblet cells that produce the mucus. And then on this side, you can see you have inflammatory bowel disease. The picture here where you know, that we had that earlier image where we saw that one place the mucus layer was all broken down, right? And we could see that things were getting in and moving closer to the cells causing problems. In this case right here, the inflammatory process, whether the, and we're talking about either Crohn's disease or colitis here, right, ulcerative colitis generally with inflammatory bowel disease, is that there's a disruption at the mucus layer, and then there's a disruption at this, this um, tight gap junction. And the tight gap junctions are becoming larger 
and they're out of, out of control, and things are getting in that shouldn't. Antigens. What are antigens? Antibody generators. Antigens. Okay? They generate antibodies. The immune system sees those things and says, huh, that's not me. Let's make an antibody. Make sure that we tag that thing. What, does that happen? what happens then? Antibody connects to the antigen, makes an antibody-antigen complex. That complex goes and sticks on the blood vessel somewhere. The body goes in, the immune system takes it apart, breaks it down, phagocytizes it. And in that process, there's a little damage to the endothelium, a little inflammation. Got to come over and repair that. There's some scarring. There's some clotting that happens. Then there's a little scar on that tissue. This thing's happen over and over again. You get tissue changes. You get arteriosclerosis. You get you know, all kinds of problems. And with autoimmunity, what happens is you get the stimulation of the immune system tagging its own tissues as non-self in the process of that inflammation and that autoimmune, uh, that antibody-antigen re- relationship where you get these particles are gathering in the bloodstream of these antigen-antibody complexes and they're getting caught up in the joints is a place we often see it, like with rheumatoid arthritis. And when that happens, the immune system is going through this big process of phagocytizing all these materials and trying to break it down. And in that process, it's very turbid and cloudy. And what happens is a part of you becomes part of the antigen and you now have an antibody to you. And that's the autoimmunity. Now, the cool thing is we can always just give people, you know, tapeworms or something like that, and we can turn it around for you. Um, so inflammatory bowel, we've got, you know, ulcerative colitis. A lot of this, you know, you're looking for blood in the stools, blood and mucus um, in both of these conditions, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Ulcerative colitis is only in the large intestine, whereas Crohn's is in both. And Crohn's is really an autoimmune disease. And the reason we know that is because when you cut part of the colon or the small intestine out of the body and anastomose it together again, what happens is the Crohn's disease occurs in another place. With colitis, often that isn't the case. If they cut, cut out a piece, I mean, I'm not, I'm not advocating um, you know, resection of colon to treat colitis, but th- what we've seen is that the, and, and the autoimmune component of Crohn's disease is definitely verified to some degree by the fact that it'll show up somewhere else if you take out the piece that was affected. Obviously, if you, if you don't change the ecosystem, if you don't change the environment, you're going to have the problem, right? So pharmaceuticals that are being used right now there's a necessary shift from pharmacogenetics to pharmacometabolomics. Why? Because the microbes are acting on the, on the drugs. Just like they're acting on us, they're interfacing with the nerves. You saw those dendrites in that last picture, right? That picture I just showed you a minute ago. You can see these little, these are the dendrites right here. Boom, these nerves, look at that. Tink, dendritic cells sticking right in there. They're interfacing right there. So <clears throat> we need to include the, the microbes in the metabolic process of how we deal with drugs, toxins, any kind of compounds. We're not considering the bugs. We think about pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics as it relates to just the human body and the liver hepatic metabolism, but we're not considering the fact that the microbe population is having a huge effect on how we metabolize drugs. And so it's different from every person, right? It's so diverse, so the way we metabolize drugs is gonna be very diverse, not just because of our genetics, but also because of our microbiomes. Okay, antibiotics, we know those are, we know a lot about those, right? Everybody's pretty familiar with those. Um, Proton pump inhibitors, right, like Prilosec, antihistamines like Tagamet, 5-HT inhibitors, that's a serotonin inhibitor, like Ondansetron or Zofran, um, and NSAIDs, Celebrex, aspirin, acetaminophen, ibuprofen, meloxapam, these are NSAIDs. And all these drugs are drugs that we use, and they're all related to the GI tract, um, antibiotics, of course, have a huge effect on the microbiota because they're nonspecific. They target a huge population. You might be trying to get rid of one dysbiotic population that's somewhere in the body. You give an antibiotic, it kills off that population, but it also destroys everybody else in the process. And you've got to rebuild, and that's the hard part. Okay? Proton pump inhibitors, well, we just talked about hydrochloric acid. Maybe some of you missed that part, but how important it is in so many, you know, for so many reasons, protecting our bodies from infections, digesting our food, making nutrients available, um, inducing the, the, the full output of digestive enzymes in the rest of the GI tract. When we take Prilosec, it's blocking that. It's inhibiting the production of hydrochloric acid. That's the, that is the treatment. The treatment is to cause all those problems, which leads to what? Osteoporosis. Which leads to what? Which leads to malabsorption. Which leads to what? Which leads to 
GI problems deeper down in the alimentary canal. From what I know about proton pump inhibitors is that they were originally supposed to be used short term. This is for a person who has an ulcer, right? There's damage to the stomach lining, the ulcer is present, so there's an ulceration, right? Which means that the tissue is exposed inside the stomach. And what's happening, or inside the small intestine for that matter, let's say it's in the stomach in this case. And the ulcer is a very sensitive bit of tissue, and hydrochloric acid is continuing to irritate it, okay? So when you take a proton pump inhibitor, the, the amount of acid in the, in the stomach goes down, and then that ulcer can heal. So, okay, do that. Let the ulcer heal. Now stop the proton pump inhibitor. Now we go back to doing other things. We help the person's digestion in whatever way we need to. But what's happening nowadays is people go into their doctor, I got a little bit of heartburn. Oh, really? Okay, well, let's switch on a proton pump inhibitor. Boom, oh, heartburn's gone. Yeah, sure. So is your digestion, you know? <laughs> so I don't like those drugs. I think they're, they can be very useful in the short-term context. So, but watch, you'll watch your patients, you'll see. People are on them for years, years. And it's hard to get off them when you're on them for years, too. But I'm good at getting people off. Antihistamines, Tagamet. So these are drugs that block the histamine, which, again, stimulates the serotonin, which, you know, this is oftentimes used for, you know, these kind of allergic reactions people have or just people have a, a you know, um, digestive problems, even heartburn, things like that, because the histamine will stimulate the hydrochloric acid production. It's another way to get at the hydrochloric acid by you know, in, in, inhibiting the cells that stimulate the hydrochloric acid. It's a little bit less of a force. It doesn't inhibit the hydrochloric acid as much as the proton pump inhibitor. Um, they can be pretty effective for some people, but again, it's going to lead to problems. You're going to reduce your, your hydrochloric acid production. Serotonin inhibitors on Dansetron, these things work pretty well in the case of like, you know, chemo-induced nausea. Um, that's, it's a place where I find them to be pretty useful. I, a lot of patients do well on them. Um, not, nowhere near as useful as a medical cannabis in that application, which is legal in Oregon. Um, it's much more beneficial for folks than these drugs, but these drugs do work, and they work by blocking serotonin. And the serotonin has that vagal afferent effect causing nausea when the person has a toxin, the body's like, get the toxin out, so you start feeling nauseous and you vomit, so you get rid of the stuff. So it blocks that response. And the whole point of chemotherapy is, well, this stuff would kill you, but you know, we're going to keep it in your body and kill all the cancer and hold you together. Uh, NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. You know, when aspirin was first invented, it was based on salicylates, right, which came from plants like white willow. Um, and the first person to develop aspirin acetyl salicylic acid found that if they combined an acetyl group with aspirin, you inhibited the stomach damage that you could get when you took high doses of just salicylic acid as a single agent. It doesn't happen with the herbs. The herbs are much more balanced, but when you isolate the salicylic acid, you get stomach problems. And people back in the turn of the century, the 1900s, they would get a lot of <clears throat> ulcers and pain after taking the salicylate isolate, and so the, once they put the acetyl group on there, it minimized that effect to some degree. But the acetyl group also has another effect. It actually inhibits platelets from aggregating. That's why aspirin is the only NSAID that's useful for inhibiting clotting. And that's why none of these other ones do that, because they don't have the acetyl group. And that's also why the salicylate plants don't do that because of their salicylate. They don't cause a reduction in clotting, like white willow. Not due to that compound, not due to the um, the salicylate, but due to other actions like coumarins and other compounds in the plant that might help with, you know, moving blood and pre preventing blood stagnation. But so what do we do about this? Because these, what happens is these, these, um, all of these NSAIDs inhibit COX-1 and COX-2, and we know that when you inhibit cyclooxygenase, you cause damage to the gut lining, and that's just part of the deal. And so people who have problems with these drugs generally are having bleeding problems. It's normally the elderly, and they've normally been on NSAIDs for a long time for their pain. You know, osteoarthritis is a big one. Take NSAIDs and then end up with gastric bleeding. So we don't want to be using these things long term either. So again, these drugs, none of them should be used long term. So I want to talk about SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. It's really just, it is what it sounds like. It's just, there's too many bugs. There's just too many microbes in that part of the, of the digestive tract, the small intestine. And it oftentimes has to do with motility, imp impaired microvilli function, and um, leading to the fact that you can't move the bowels out as much. And I often think it's a problem with a valve called the ileocecal valve. And the ileocecal valve is the valve between the small intestine and large intestine, between the ileum and the cecum. 
and that valve we've talked about for a minute earlier today, where it's, you know, it's controlled by both nerves and endocrine hormones. And it's very important because if you can't get the vowels out moving into the colon, where there's supposed to be a lot of bugs, the biggest amount of bugs is in the colon. Like 70% of the GI bugs are all in the colon. That's where we have the most microbiota, most of them bifidus even. And that, when that's not working right and that big population of bugs starts migrating upwards because the ileocecal valve isn't opening properly, you have these overgrowths in the small intestine, problems with the microvilli, um, and, then, and then you've got problems eliminating entirely and you get this buildup of bacteria, which then can lead to all kinds of things like diarrhea and loose stools and you know, all kinds of problems. And you know, naturopaths are real big on studying this thing um, and really trying to treat it. I find a lot of naturopaths actually treat it with antibiotics and then repair the person with um, you know, probiotics and other nourishing restorative plants. But I've found that it doesn't always work. And plus, antibiotics are just so you know, damaging to so much more of the population. It's just that sometimes it gets so out of control that it's really hard to tamp it back down. So you've got to kind of do a many-layered approach to get it under control. And you've got to treat you know, the ileocecal valve problem, which I do by eliminating... Sugar, wheat, dairy, corn, soy, nuts, seeds, chips, popcorn, cocoa, caffeine, alcohol, nicotine. Okay? No, I got, I've got a list down the road. We'll get there. Okay. Um, so early microbiome hunters, we had Alexander Fleming. Dun, dun, dun. He came out, and they were looking to kill off these bugs. They discovered the bugs, and the kind of germ theory, they were like, this is the deal. These bugs are causing our problems. This is it. We just need to kill the bugs, and we'll feel great. So what they did is they developed some antibiotics that could kill disease-causing bacteria, right? And they did that. So, but they didn't really realize that they also killed all the helpful bugs too, like Acidophilus and Bifidus. And then once you give someone antibiotics and then they get opportunistic infections that gain a foothold and start growing, you get all kinds of problems. You know, infections, depression, chronic fatigue, sinusitis, all kinds of issues. This is not news. So let's talk about antibiotics a little more. A drastic reduction in the diversity of the microbiome because they target a lot of different bugs. They talk, target a lot of different species, genuses, and they, they're, they're very broad acting. And they can weaken the community. And like I said before, if you're a person who already has a, a, a non-diverse, a very non-resilient kind of uh, tentative microbiota, then you're going to have a hard time recovering from antibiotics. Whereas if you're a person who's very strong and has a very strong population, you'll probably bounce back. So uh, pathobionts, these are um, organisms that kind of work with us but also have a negative effect um, because when, when you take antibiotics, obviously, you knock out all their competitors. And so candida is like, sweet, you killed off all the bacteria? Well, we're going to charge it, man. We're going to live everywhere now. And so bacteria just start getting out of the way and candida comes on strong. So the aftermath of antibiotic administration lasts a long time. This was kind of, people always say, especially medical doctors, oh, yeah, it's fine, just take antibiotics, no problem, you know. <laughs> the effects are, they're, they're kind of insidious. It's, it's long-term stuff. It doesn't just go away overnight. It's not just like you, got, you felt bad one minute and then, then you're fine. No, it's actually like little bits over time, and it's cumulative, especially kids taking antibiotics over and over again throughout their lives for, you know, for all kinds of stuff, the ear infections, the tonsil things, you know, any kind of a cold or flu, oh, strep throat, you know, everything, you're just constantly being bombarded with antibiotics, and you're developing. As a developing person, it's just like we always talk about the developing brain, don't give them this, don't give them that. Well, it's the same, we should be talking about it with the developing enteric nervous system brain. Don't damage it in a developing human. So other things that come up with this are diarrhea as a result, you know, oftentimes people take Antibiotics, and of course you get the patient, you know, if you have a clinical practice that's busy, you always get patients that come in that are like, yeah, I took antibiotics, no, I've had diarrhea for six weeks, I can't deal with it, I don't know what to do. Oftentimes, C. difficile, right, C. diff, clostridium infection, salmonella infection, and people just become, they're more susceptible to more infections after you've done the antibiotics, okay? So here's the autism connection. Disease, disease onset follows antimicrobial therapy. Extensive antibiotic use is commonly associated with late-onset autism. This is data. Trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole antibiotics don't kill C. diff. They kill a lot of bugs, but they don't kill C. diff. So a lot of kids who got antibiotics, these ones in particular, at a young age, end up with this stuff, Clostridium species, who take a foothold. They have a niche now that never was there before. 
You just blew apart their mucus layer and their biology and at the microbiota level, and suddenly Clostridium is like, oh my God, this is awesome. All my competitors are dead. I'm going to grow and proliferate. We're going to build biofilms, and we're going to dominate. And they do. And then you get all these weird neurotransmitters that start happening, this, all, this whole change in the mental, because all that chatter between the enteric nervous system and the brain starts being altered heavily. And now you're not happy. You're not getting the serotonin. You don't want the hug. You don't want to love your friends anymore. You want to kind of hang out by yourself. And you don't really know how to communicate with people because you don't have any serotonin. You don't have any dopamine. You're not feeling rewarded. You're not feeling good. You don't know how to socially interact. It gets back to that autism socially interacting thing with the microbiota and the socialization and the interconnection with humans. We can't just screw it all up because we don't know how to do medicine anymore. They did a little test. They, uh, they, they give people vancomycin, which clearly kills Clostridia species. And it, symptoms of autism would go away in a lot of kids. They'd get better on vancomycin. But you know what? Clostridia has spores. And they don't get killed by vancomycin. So as soon as you take them off the drug, symptoms come back. What if you treated the Clostridia in a different way? What if you built the strongest microbiota you could in their bodies? What if you did everything right and you really built them up and you stabilized their system and the Clostridia slowly over time was just dominated by all the other species and suddenly Clostridia was pushed back into its original place, which is a small place? What would happen then? Yeah? I'm almost there, the stool implants. I'm almost there. So it, it just, this is cool because this one guy went to the Amish community and he was looking for autism. There wasn't any. There were literally, there were three kids and they were all, all the reasons that the three all had, one of them was adopted from a Mennonite family, one of them was from China who was brought over at a young age and the other one I think didn't have, the history was unknown. But out of 130 children that he thought he would find, he only found three. And they were, and like I said, they all had other issues. So Amish people didn't use antibiotics. They don't use drugs. They live in a simple life. They do a lot of things we talked about. They pretty much live in a permaculture type of connection with their world. Yes? What is this panda? Pandas? Pandas. Isn't that sort of it is, but let's just, let's just not even open that can right now. I just have too much to get through. Um, large intestine and bifidus. Bifidus is the dominant probiotic bacteria in the large intestine. It helps maintain the mucus layer. We've got to have that mucus layer, right? That's what keeps, that's that protective barrier from us and the bugs, and it's also the ground that they can live on. So I, I put up here some bifidus enema ideas, some, you know, a, a one billion bifidus powder, like a tablespoon, mix in a fleet enema bottle, insert at bedtime. It's a great way to do a retention enema for folks to help rebuild their bifidus culture in their colon, and this is outside of doing a fecal transplant, which is still, it's still experimental, um, but they can do this at home and do it every night for a month or two, and you see a lot of people's symptoms improve greatly. So what about the appendix? A, a diverticulum, you know, a little pocket in the intestines. What is it? Well, it used to be thought that it's a repository for infection. Let's get that damn thing out of there. We're already in here. We're already taking your gallbladder out. Let's get this thing out anyway. Um, but we found out now that actually there's a lot of Immune-mediated biofilms, there's, there's a, a reservoir of good bugs that live there. It's actually a place where we colonize and we maintain by our immune system interacting with the bugs. We house them, a population that represents our overall population. We keep them happy in our appendix so that when we get a protozoan or a bug, a, a, a worm infection, and we have diarrhea and we clear everything out, we just reseed it from our appendix. Clostridium infection is more common post-appendectomy. So let's talk about assessing people. We've got our, we're back to our original concept, right? Macroecological versus micro-rational. You guys clear on those, that idea? Just We're coining those terms. So you start with a constitutional picture. You've got to have a way to see into the black box of the body. So what I mean by that is you just have to, you have to, you have to figure out how to understand what's happening in the person's body. Observation, the way people walk, the way they move, the way they talk, the way they breathe, the way they smell, the way they sound. All those things are important in your observation. And I think that what happens is at the level of our gut, where we're really feeling instinct and intuition and a sense of knowingness that's not connected to our rational brain. We haven't already gone, well, they moved kind of quickly, or they, you know, they moved slowly, or that guy has a pen in his pocket. It probably means he likes to 
you know, he sits at a desk, or those kind of things outside of the way, the first hit you get is something that you know about that person or something you know about that dog. The dog walks across the room, and you immediately know, ooh, I'm, that's not friendly. It's not because you rationally worked it out like Sherlock Holmes. It's that you actually had a sense, a hit. So be aware, be present in that meditative place, and use your enteric nervous system as a way to know what someone's got going on, what they need. And then you apply your thorough questioning. You do your physical exam. You look at their tongue and their pulse. And I don't care what you practice, you look at people's tongues. It's like a dipstick into their GI tract. It's like, oh, well, how's the oil? Oh, it looks, looks like you could use a little more. You know, it really, it really is. So we're back to eight principles, Chinese medicine. When you're looking at the person, yin and yang, hot or cold, excess deficiency, internal, external, just get these in your mind and try to remember them and just start to understand how to, how to work this stuff. A yang disease is one that comes on fast. It's acute, high fever, it's an infection, it's blown up, it's yellow, it's red, it's hot. That's yang type of condition. The yin condition is slow. It's like a little, you know, I had a cough, and then it developed into a little bit more of a cough. And then slowly over the last few months, I've been getting sicker. That's a yin type condition. Hot conditions are pretty obvious. You got heat, you know. You look for redness on the tongue. You look for yellow color on the tongue. You look for thick, thick coat. You look for people that have hot signs, fevers, sweats, those kind of things. Cold disorders, it's the opposite. People get cold easily. You're looking for white color. You're looking for pale. You're looking for a colder presentation. With excess and deficiency, excess people have something that they have too much of. In Chinese medicine, we're looking at pathological factors. Too much dampness, too much heat, too much cold. You've got too much um, phlegm. You've got too much wind. These are excesses. Deficiencies are organs that don't have enough. You don't have enough of something. You, I, I, you need more blood. You need more nourishment. You need more iron. You know, you can be deficient in a nutrient. You need more B12. These are deficiencies. And then external or internal. That's pretty self-explanatory. But important. Is this skin rash on, their, on the surface of their skin? Is that a contact dermatitis? Or is this coming from something happening in their gut? Internal, external. It's correlating symptoms. Um, in Chinese medicine, the tongue has all these different representative areas. Liver, gallbladder on the sides, stomach, spleen in the middle. A look at some tongues. Here's a normal kind of tongue. In that case, when people are qi deficient, meaning that this is really important with digestion, their tongue gets pale, often have these little red macules. If they're not very pronounced, then that's, it doesn't mean there's a lot of heat, but if you have big, bright red macules, there's more heat in the system. A hot you know, condition has a reddish-colored tongue, and these, this is really obvious. It's really not this obvious in the clinic. And you always, you know, again, whether you take the pulse, you take the tongue, you, you did your sense of the person, you do your questioning, then you put it all together, and then it makes sense. You don't just look at someone's tongue and go, oh, I know what you have, you've got Crohn's disease. You know, it's not going to work like that. You, just, you have to put it all together. Damp, dampness often has a thick, that the tongue looks puffy. It looks like it's too big for their mouth. Tooth marks along the side. That's a dampness. That means like they've got turbidity in their digestive system often. Too much of a sweet thing will get you that, to that place really quickly. Blood stasis, more purple color. Damp heat. This is something we see a lot. This is more with infections, especially bacterial infections, lead to damp heat type of conditions. Again, back to ecology. If we're clearing a bacterial infection using ecological, macroecological perspective, we're going to change the ecosystem. We're going to get the damp heat out of the system, and then whatever bacteria was dominating that was generating the damp heat doesn't have an ecosystem that supports it anymore, and it goes away. It goes back to its normal place in the ecosystem. Deficiency of yang. This is, you know, these are kind of getting, this is getting a little bit more finer details. Um, you've got more of this pale tongue, a thicker coating. Blood deficiency is a very pale tongue. So the main ones I want you to know are having a deficiency of chi, where the person gets the scallops, which is almost always combined with the damp retention, which is the puffiness. And oftentimes the coating on the tongue is greasy. Swelling, greasy tongue, scallops on the side. This is a classic case of somebody with a deficient digestive system with turbidity inside there. The soil is not good, and the mucus layer is not good, and the bugs are not good. Here's some examples of a spleen chi deficiency tongue. This one has a little bit more dampness to it. You see it's a little bit more puffy in here. It's got these little, you can see it's got these little bits of scallops. 
deficiency of the chi. The chi is supposed to lift the energy and hold the body in place, and the tongue is kind of flabby, and it's like it's not being held in place, and so it's getting these forms of the teeth. That's the example. Damp heat, thicker coat. You see this thick coat? This is, there's damp heat. So this could easily be, you know, someone has a bacterial infection. They've got some, like a big overgrowth of something going on. Thicker coat, yellow color. Thicker coat, yellow color. The tongue is a little red here too, a little red here, a little, little bit of purple here, so they've got a little blood stagnation too. So we're putting together these pieces. Fluid deficiency. This is a yin deficiency in the spleen, where the spleen actually is deficient in fluids, and it's, it's weakened in that way. You see more cracks in this tissue surface. There's no coat. There should always be a thin coat, a thin white coat on the tongue. It should be a nice, even pink color, and just add a kind of a nice, even thinness. Now the liver getting into some phlegm heat, stagnant phlegm, thick gooey stuff with heat in the liver, this thick greasy sticky coat with redness on the sides. Remember this is the spleen and stomach area, this is the gallbladder liver area, and again over here, redness over here, thicker slimy or greasy kind of coat, yellow color. Another way to diagnose people is to do a comprehensive diagnostic stool analysis. Yes. Be very similar. Very, very similar. It's hard, hard to say why it might, I mean, what would actually look different. You might call it spleen and stomach yin deficiency. Although the stomach, stomach yin deficiency is not as oftenly found. The stomach is just designed to be so hot. You know, it's actually, its analogy is a high mountain lake, so it's generally dry. It's considered a very dry place, whereas the spleen is considered a very wet place. So the spleen, when the wetness goes away, it gets dry. That's the spleen yin shoe. Um, the stomach can more often is yang deficient too, where you have like not as much fire coming up. What do you think about? I, I've never heard of spleen yin. Never heard of spleen yin? Yeah, this is actually um, Guo Hui Liu was one of my professors at Ocom. He was the one who wrote the book on worm diseases a few years back, and this was one of his diagnoses. And Machiocha also talks about it a lot. That could be. And they're not, it's not always that obvious, you know, that it's this, it's a hard one. Spleen yin deficiency is a hard one to pick out. But you're probably right. This is more swollen. It's a great concept. So I went straight, so this is going micro-rational on the diagnosis where you get into the comprehensive stool analysis. Um, brown color in the stool. It's, it's the bile, right? Bile acting on, on the stool. And it's bacteria acting on the bile that actually... Turns, the, turns it from that kind of greenish biliary color into a more brown color. pH of the bowel should be between 6 and 7.8. If you find blood there, it's probably some kind of an inflammatory cause that's leading to some bleeding in the stool. That's, you want to look, that's probably a part of an inflammatory bowel disease. Um, microflora, you look at the, what's there and we look at you know, commensal symbiotic or dysbiotic bugs and look at what they look like and try to find out if there's any way we can understand from that flora how that is something we can affect and how do we treat it. It's often nice to see, oh wow, this person has a very dysbiotic group of bacteria living in their GI tract or they have some blastocystis hominis, a, proto you know, a protozoan that's causing them some problems. It's nice to know those things, it's, and especially if you've done your treatments and you're, you're kind of trying to help the person's gut out, but you're not getting anywhere, then getting a stool analysis is a nice place to go. You can do microscopic yeast studies where they look for yeast under the microscope, and then sometimes you culture them as well. They might pop up where you didn't see them. It's good to get both. I always have people do the parasitology times three. So you do have three different separate stool samples that you use to make sure you didn't miss something, something that might have not have been active or was in another form in its life cycle, ova and parasites. Uh, fecal fat, this is like steatorrhea, someone's got, they're not digesting fat well, so you look at the biliary system. Uh, muscle fibers, this is like in, incomplete digestion, people are not digesting food all the way, and so muscle fibers are coming through. Vegetable fibers, uh, most of the time it's like people are just not, not chewing their food well, they're not digesting well because they're on the run, they're just not taking the time to eat. Um, carbohydrates, again that's probably carbohydrate malabsorption problems. Someone's having a hard time digesting carbohydrates. You'll see that as we get into the dietary stuff, um, this is something that just leads to understanding that they're having some kind of a digestive issue on the whole. They could have uh, an, an enzyme deficiency or just a lack of energy in one of the organs that helps with the enzymes. 
These, lactoferrin is an iron transport protein and calprotectin, uh, another protein that both have to do with differentiating inflammatory causes. So when these are elevated, it's an indicator that there's inflammation in the bowel, which means that there's an inflammatory cause. Then you can start thinking, oh, great, this person really needs more anti-inflammatory approach, which where you get into your turmerics and your boswellia, you get into um, all, the, all the different herbs and therapies that would reduce inflammation. I like all the coptis and hydrastis, all the berberine-rich plants as well for this area of the body and especially for inflammation. And lysozyme also is associated with this inflammatory process that helps you differentiate an inflammatory process versus another something else. And it's nice to know that. Even if this is all you got out of your stool sample is that you had an elevated lactoferrin, oh, cool, well, let's just go target inflammation on top of what we're doing as far as trying to do our dietary stuff and pull out insults and support your kidney adrenal system and you know, do the things we're doing to help your gut. Well, let's also put some stuff in there to kind of reduce inflammation. We'll probably get a better result. We've got white blood cells showing up, showing immunological activity. Um, secretory IgA, we talked about that a bit. If it's elevated, you've got a kind of a hyperactive immune response. If it's low, it means that you're having a, a low immune response. And sometimes when it's low, the person needs support or the di digestive tract is not strong. Oftentimes, like I said, glutamine is the thing you can give in combination with other agents. Mucus in the stool, also an indication of potential problems um, relating to the, with the blood up here, it can often be a part of those inflammatory bowel disease um, conditions. And we've got short-chain fatty acids, which are also analyzed really well um, in the, the, the comprehensive diagnostic stool analysis. Those are a really good way to assess, again, bacterial function, how the bacteria is working with your intake of fiber, because the end product of fermentation of dietary fiber by beneficial flora is short-chain fatty acids. The main one here being butyrate, and butyrate being a very part, a significant part of human energy. We derive a lot of energy from butyrate, and there's a, a, acetate and propionate. There's a few more that are all part of this um, digestive process of lactobacilli and bifidobacteria digesting fiber to create these metabolites in a symbiotic relationship that allow us to derive energy. They also control the pH in our digestive tract, which before I said it's got to be in the right zone, 6 to 7.8. It's important that the pH is normalized by the bugs. They do a good job of maintaining it. Uh, levels of butyrate in total SCFA reflect the levels of the flora that are beneficial or relates to how much fiber you're taking in or how much you need. Um, some beneficial effects of, of short-chain fatty acids helps reduce food intake in people when you've got more of it because you're able to derive energy, improves glucose tolerance, modulates your immune function, activates epithelial cell signaling pathways, and has some anti-cancer properties. Um, I know in colorectal cancer, butyrate does have some anti-cancer properties. Do you ever see um, levels of or the other one that You mean like the different ones, like one versus the other? I, you know, it's, it's, it's funny because most of the tests I look at, you can they look, you give you like four different percentages of the individual ones. And if any one of them is out of there, then you're going to look at, okay, what's going on with the fluoride? What's going on with the fibers? Or do I need to change the fiber? And that's we'll get to the FODMAPs diet and look at how we want to think about which types of FODMAP foods this person can or can't have in order to kind of balance that out for them. They probably need some more fiber or they need some probiotics and they need some other fermented foods or a different diet that gets a different bug to have more of a foothold in their digestive tract. But if you see that the short chain fatty acids, it'll be given as a whole as well, is low, then you'll find that the person really needs to get some help in the, the, the kind of flora and or the kind of fiber and that relationship. Okay, so we're going to move to some thera therapeutics. And people have already asked me this question a couple times. Fecal transplants. I am fascinated by this fecal transplant thing. It's so cool. And it sounds gross, but it, and, it, and it is kind of, you know. Um, but it's really amazing because the first guy to do it was this guy, Ge Hong, 1,700 years ago. 1,700 years ago, this guy did a, did, basically took someone's stool from a healthy person the other person had a disease. He did that, shook that up in water, put it in a, you know, some kind of an animal thing they had at the time, and then gave it to that person who was sick, and that person got well. And he recorded it, and now it's been in our mind. It's sort of something we could do for the last 1,700 years. So recently, you see that 
things are happening. People with multiple sclerosis getting fecal material transplants, um, getting to normal defecation, and ending the neurological problems. And the research has now gone into chronic fatigue syndrome, irritable bowel syndrome, um, inflammatory bowel disease, autoimmune diseases, cancer. It's, it's starting to become very powerful. And m- m- what's that? Alcoholism. Alcoholism. Addiction, right? Addictive personalities. You can't get over it. Give them a fecal, fecal matter transplant from somebody who's not addicted and suddenly, you know. And the thing is, is that what they saw with these studies is that the fecal matter transplants would actually give you a long-lasting, a persistent change in your gut flora. Whereas, you know, what we do with probiotics, when we take in probiotics orally, it's a very transient thing. You know, it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't stick like it does with fecal microbiota transplants. With the fecal transplants, what they saw is that they would keep analyzing people over time and their flora would stabilize to that new introduction. It's like basically reseeding the whole system. Well, there are definitely, there's definitely a lot of scrutiny. And like that's what someone was asking me is, do we know where to get this right now? And I don't know where to get it right now. There's some clinical trials going on, and there have been clinical trials. And like I showed you before, there's some rat studies and things. But for the most part, um, with fecal, with fecal transplants, it, there's a lot of screening that goes on to the donor because they want to make sure that the donor doesn't have any dysbiotic flora, doesn't have any you know, mental, emotional problems. They have to be screened thoroughly and make sure it's a match for the person who's going to be the receiving the transplant. We're going to have to keep moving, guys. But... Emory, like just you could go in and get them. Oh, there's a lot of places that have done them and are doing them. I just don't know if there's. You do them? Emory. Emory. Here. Yeah. It's yeah, it's big. Yeah. yeah, it's it's coming, but it's just not quite there yet. So if if you do have a place where, I, where it's, so what you're saying, ma'am, is that patients can actually go there and sign up for fe, for fecal transplants? Is that right? Is this a place so people can go to Emory if they have a, if they want to get a fecal? Okay, that's great to know. Um, I don't think there's any. I mean, I, the LD50s are huge for all those plants. Uh, only if you lose 50% of your test. No, I'm saying that the dose, I mean, if you look, you look at Chen's book, you know, Chen, if, you, if you, you know John Chen, his pharmacology book, I mean, the, the LD50s are huge. You'd have to take gallons of the stuff. Because I just go by the commissioning. Uh, for, for which berberine plants? Are you talking about berberine as an isolate, or are you talking about berberine-rich plants? No, just as well. I mean, my, my first place I... I used to take, take gold powder. It's in a spoon drawer. And then I found out that it was rated LD50, which means 50% of the lab rats died. What, what dose? What's the dose? <laughs> this was way back in the 60s. I didn't know about doses. Well, everything will kill 50% of your animals at some point. That's the point. That's the LD50 test. Yeah. I mean, if you take enough of anything, you'll die. I mean, water. Okay, we're moving on. Um, probiotics. So just to say, you know, just to think about probiotics, we all are excited about them, and more of them are coming out, and I, I want to get 12 different kinds or 18 different strains, or I'm going to get them from the soil, I'm going to get them from wherever, and it's really exciting. But, you know, ultimately, if you're using probiotics, it's probably not the kind of thing where they're going in and they're filling in the niches of the places where there's these open spaces where you just don't have that bug. It's probably not doing that. It's probably acting as they go inside and they're interacting with the population that's already there. They're, they're releasing bacteriosins. They're releasing antifungal compounds. They're kind of fighting fighting for position within the ecological communities that are already there, and they're having a role, almost like targeted antibiotics. They're almost, they're almost better targeted antibiotics than anything else we have because they literally can go in and target all the things that they're, they're their competitors. So if you take lactobacillus and bifidus, for example, those are symbiotic, you know, mutualistic organisms for our GI tract. They're going to help, but they're not necessarily going to fill in all the gaps that you have in your body for them. Um, there's definitely a lot of good research on you know, using probiotics, and soil-based probiotics are probably a really great source because imagine, forever, you guys, we ate food out of the dirt. 
You know, why don't we get dirt anymore? Well, because we're afraid of germs. We're afraid of germs. We're afraid of ourselves. We're ten to one germs. So, just you know, they're great. They work. There's a lot of great data, but I think we need to be careful with how we apply them and how kind of how far we go with our you know just deep expansion into finding probiotics. Because like I said before, you can't just say, oh, this is this is what the perfect human's microbiota looks like. If we give them the probiotic that has that spectrum, we're going to be really helping them out. I don't think it works like that. So probiotics are great. They're really helpful. And you've got something like Saccharomyces boulardii, which is a fungal, which is a yeast, which is very specific for E. coli. It's really good in E. coli cases to help dominate the ecosystem and, and take up some of the areas that the E. coli would have normally been occupying. Transient inhabitation effect on the intestine. Versus the fecal transplants, which have a very long-lasting effect on the population. I lost the end of that, the last part of that. What was the... Is there a colonizing probiotic? Is there a study that shows that there was a colonizing probiotic? The only studies I saw said that the, most of it was transient, that there's not really anything that says that you take them in and you get like, you know, you have to take a, if you took germ-free mice and you gave them probiotics, you'd probably get, you know, the beginning of colonization because fermented foods is one of the places that we get a lot of our probiotics, you know? But those are fairly meaningless studies. Right. Well, how does it act? How does it interact? Well, they're similar enough that we study them for that reason because there's enough similarity that we learn things. I mean, I, I don't like it anyway, but I hear you. Well, we know that we eat, you know, if we eat things, if we eat foods and we, and we take in soil, we know that that does help form our bacterial population for sure. I just don't think that taking high doses of probiotics of an isolated form or 20 forms or 100 forms and taking it in a powder is the same thing. And I don't know that it's going to, like, you know, repopulate all the bugs that we want and, you know, it's not going to replace what's already there. Well, we'll get there. <laughs> so prebiotics, right, is the food for microbes. Fructooligosaccharides are a big one. Inulin, these are, these are things that are non-digestible fiber compounds that pass undigested through the upper part of the GI tract. They stimulate the growth of advantageous bacteria that colonize the large bowel. Of course, if you give a lot of these to someone with SIBO, they get a lot worse really fast because you're feeding all the bad bugs too. A lot of, a lot of bugs that are dysbiotic will feed on those prebiotics too. Um, here's some prebiotic foods, chicory, Jerusalem artichoke, burdock garlic leeks, onion, and asparagus. These are all good foods that are prebiotics. Um, like I said, inulin, you'll often find inulin in some probiotics. They'll put that in, which is a long chain of... Uh, polysaccharides, that is this kind of non-digestible fiber. Digestive enzymes, this is another therapy. People often, I mean, I've got patients coming in the clinic all the time, yeah, I take digestive enzymes. I'm like, really? Really? That's what, okay, well, I mean, maybe we need them for a short period of time, and I think that using them for a short period of time during a rehab is really a good thing to do. It can be really important. But I also think that if you're taking them all the time, your body's not going to be getting better at making its own. I'd rather support the body's ability to make enzymes than have somebody take enzymes all the time. Now, that said, we do know that our food supply is incredibly altered. We're not getting a lot of good soil organisms. We're not getting a lot of good digestive enzymes that normally would exist in the foods. Foods are normally replete with all of their live enzymes. And once you've taken the food, extracted it from the ground, cleaned it off, washed it, stuck it in the refrigerator, shipped it over to Iowa, brought it back to California, powdered it, and then ate it, it doesn't have the live enzymes it had when it was a carrot. So maybe taking some digestive enzymes, if your diet isn't giving you what you need, is still a good idea. You know, especially people that have a really, you know, if you're getting to the point where your digestion is poor, especially if you're older, these can be really important things. These are just the different types of enzymes. Pancreatin is one that a lot of people are really into. It's got a lot of, you know, kind of headline news. It's basically protease, lipase, and, uh, um, and amylase. And this one right here is, you know, these are just the isolates, but the pancreatin has them all together. Most of the stuff's coming from the pancreas, some of it from the small intestine. This is how we're breaking down. This is how we're back to that original idea that we're taking these compounds and we're breaking them down into smaller and smaller bits to be able to absorb them. So polysaccharides, these are these long chains of sugars. The microbiota of our, of our bodies depends on these polysaccharides. And... They help us because 
the host, we can't really digest polysaccharides very well, especially like cellulose, you know, cell wall type materials from a lot of the plants that we eat or from mushrooms. We don't digest that stuff well. If we were, you know, herbivores with a different stomach, maybe we could, but our microbes break down a lot of this, these compounds, these polysaccharides for us and help us to absorb them and digest them. Some of the things that the polysaccharides are good at doing, improving the ratio of probiotics, decreasing the gut pH, stimulating the immune system. A lot of these things that we've looked at today stimulate the immune system, right? They help the immune system function. The immune system's really dependent on these things. We've got seaweeds, which are kind of like the more slimy, long types of uh, mucopolysaccharides that are really good for helping with the gut lining. Echinacea and astragalus, plants that have a lot of um, polysaccharides. We think of these plants as being immune stimulants, right, in kind of a Western meta uh, uh, botanical perspective. And then medicinal mushrooms, which, uh, you know, in their chitinous cell walls, they have beta-glucans, right? We always talk about beta-glucans and alpha-glucans. Those are polysaccharides that are inside the mushrooms that are very strong stimulators for our immune system. And in our GI tract, they interact with the microbiota, they interact with the immune system, and they change the neurological endocrine function from that, that interaction. So I talked about glutamine earlier. This is a conditionally essential amino acid. So we said that we needed to have glutamine in order to make our secretory IgA. Well. If you're under stress, you're undernourished, you're overstressed, you're undernourished, you don't make enough glutamine to supply all your needs. It's conditionally essential. So when we can't make enough of it, we're at a deficiency. It's, to me, it's the ultimate spleen tonic nutrient. Out of the nutrients we have, it's a really good one to tonify the Chinese spleen, the, the functional spleen. It's fuel for the cells of the small intestine, and I like to use a form called glute immune, which is a covalently bonded form of glutamine. It's not L-glutamine. It's just a little bit more absorbable for folks. It's supposedly 10 times more bioavailable and more stable. Um, I give it pretty good doses for people. If you're doing chemotherapy, you're really beating up your GI tract, you're really killing off your bugs and your, your IgA is suffering, I give people you know, 10, 20 grams a day. For most normal folks, you can do a dose of like five grams once a day is a nice dose of glutamine. In cancer, if someone has active cancer and you're trying to help them and they want to do a natural treatment, I don't give glutamine in that context as an isolated thing in high doses because it can fuel cancer cells too. It can be used for fuel by a lot of cells. So it kind of becomes like a sugar at that point. But if they're doing chemotherapy and they're getting treatment like that and you're trying to support them through it, it's great. So we'll talk about diet and genetics a little bit because I want to get into the dietary part of this. So, you know, where our food informs our genes about our environment and modifies our gene expression. So the food that we eat, what we take in, the soil that we make informs us. It changes our genetics. It changes the epigenetics, how our genes function. It turns on and off systems. It turns on and off tumor suppressor genes. You know, we know this kind of stuff. It's all coming out in the data. It's getting really clear that diet informs our genetics. So... What are we talking about epigenetics here? We're talking about gene function and protein expression. So we're actually changing what our cells make and produce, and our food is the direct link. We talked about SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. Um, these are kind of like the individual genetic components that we can look at in a person and identify, well, are they having a problem here or there? And this gets back to the 23andMe test that everybody's been really excited about, you know, Ancestry.com, and tests that look at all of your epigenetics through a saliva sample. And once you get the saliva sample, you go through and you check out all your genes, and then based on ones that we know something about, we study those, we look at it, we say, well, are you homozygous for that gene? You have an alteration on both alleles of that gene? Are you heterozygous? Is one allele altered and one normal? Or are you normal with that gene? And we look at things like the big popular one lately is methyl tetrahydrofolate, right? MTHF, that MTHFR gene. Everybody's really excited about it. It's great for depression and da-da-da-da. So, you know, and, and it's, it's cool, but I don't see it to be that effective in the clinic. I don't see it to do a whole lot because I think it's much more interconnected with the whole epigenetic domain, which is a very complex system. And people like Ben Lynch, the naturopath who's been really promoting um, the study of this system, looks at the cyst you know, cysteine beta uh, synthase, um, for how you break down sulfur compounds, you know, the COMT, catechol omethyltransferase, for how you break down neurotransmitters, monoamine oxidase. These are all just big words that mean that we're looking at a pathway that interacts with our body 
in some way that we could identify, like we could quantify it. We could say, yeah, you, you break down your, your estrogen much faster than this person, or you break down your dopamine faster than the other person. And we can look at those things, and hopefully the idea is to take a look at that to be able to help people and treat it by changing their nutrition and other things. I don't think we need it. I'm not excited about it right now. I was for a while, but now I think it's just kind of like there's way too much to know. It's a very complex, interconnected web. We can't possibly know how it all plays together. And plants are amazing because they deal with all this stuff for us. They have, they have a way of interacting and helping us without us having to know everything they're doing. So I'm just going to talk about yeast infections and candida. We've been talking about candida a bit. So for yeast infections, the first thing you look at is just are people itching? Do they itch, you know? Just kind of like the person that's sitting over there eating a piece of cake and they're having a cup of, you know, tea and some ice cream and they're like, it's probably because they're having a lot of yeast. And yeast will cause itching. It's a nice way to just ask people and just identify if they're having yeast overgrowth. And with too much sweet food, we get a lot of yeast overgrowth, folks. We just do. And cravings, often the cravings, like, are you want sweet stuff? You're craving these certain foods. Again, the bugs drive the cravings. Like I was saying before, yeast will drive the cravings. Bacteria will drive the cravings. All this stuff is happening for real in the research. There's the saliva test where you can kind of, like, if you think you've got yeast, you can spit into a glass. If little legs come down, you suppose they have a yeast infection. I don't know if I've tested that one out, um, but it's, it's, a lot of people like it. Um, I think it probably has some validity. The smell and body odor, people get that kind of sweet, yeasty, fermented smell. You can smell it when they walk in your office. Um, that's definitely another indication. Look at their tongue. They you know the thicker coat, that kind of thick white coat is often associated with yeast infections. You know, yeast take over in the throat too. People who are on antibiotics often get thrush, right? People who get, you know, they'll have a thrush and they'll have a growth of yeast in the throat. Um, and that's, it's a big example either of immune deficiency or of an imbalance in their fauna and flora due to, you know, probably antibiotics. Um, borborygmus, you know, the gurgling in the digestive tract, gurgling gur gas, that's a big part of candida. Um, and there's the Candida 5 test. That's a little test that you can do. It's kind of like a take-home test that helps identify Candida. It's got some validity. Um, now you'd have to kind of decide for yourself if it's something you'd need. I think you can identify it without doing the test, but I also think that most people probably could really benefit from doing an anti-candida diet, just most Americans, just because our diet's so full of carbohydrates and so full of processed foods and sugars um, that we're just, we're feeding the yeasts. They, they love that. So here's some dietary restrictions for yeasts. All the sugars, alcohol, certain, these grains, wheat, rye, oats, barley, corn, white and brown rice, processed grains and fruit, starchy veggies, even like, you know, potatoes and sweet potatoes and yams. This is, again, you're just trying to get people off of these foods for a long enough that we can re regain control of their ecosystem, okay? So you know, you've got to make sure you let people know it's not like, yeah, you're on this stuff forever. That's not, that's not you know, what's going to happen. They're really just on this stuff until we can get the ecosystem back into control. Then once the ecosystem is controlled again and stable and the yeast has its place, then if you bring in a piece of pizza or a piece of pie, it doesn't throw you completely out of balance and just feed the whole system again. Also, though, you have to make sure that when you're resetting the system with one of these diets, you have to make sure that people are really diligent. If you keep putting in a little bit of something that's not working, that keeps the population alive, you're never gonna get the results. So some people, like, they wanna be nice to their patients and they wanna be like, oh, it's okay, you can just have a little bit of that, it's fine, and they don't get well, you know? And sometimes you just have to really be, what do you say? A hard ass. You got to be a hard ass. That's right. Sometimes you just got to be a hard ass. You know, I, I definitely have had my, I, I've been known as the guy to, the anti-sugar guy in my, in, in Ashland. Um, only use good oils. You know, watch caffeine can be an irritant. Yeah. Oh, those are just, just, just those grains in general, whether you just, you know, you're taking the wheat berries, it's like a whole, like, let's say it's a whole grain bread or whatever. With those, even take them out altogether. So clearing candida, follow the diet. Um, caprylic and lauric acid from coconut. If people can't do coconut, you can do caprylic acid as tablets. Um, you know, like, like five, 600 milligram tablets. Do a few, few times a day. That's a nice addition. Caprylic acid kills off the, the yeast. And the coconut oil is a great way to go. You can just people do about three to four tablespoons a day and divided doses. I had one patient, I told her about it, and she took four tablespoons at once. She said, I feel terrible. I was like... <laughs> I didn't mean it all at once. Four <laughs> tablespoons of oil. Wow, there we go. But she did, you know, she just was okay. Um, essential oils of oregano, sage, thyme, rosemary. These are all very aromatic, 
you know, if, if funguses don't like aromatic, they don't like the breeze, they like a quiet, cool place or a warm, damp, moist place where they can grow, if you kind of like just keep breeze on them, keep them, you know, warm them up a little bit, you can dry them out and kind of get them to die back. Um, Berberine, again, I really like this one. It, the berberine kills off all kinds of infections, uh, all, all the dysbiotic organisms. It does a great job in that realm. So that's also, you know, that's the coptis, the hydrastis, um, the scutellaria. Probiotics, we've talked about those again. That they'll help us to fight off the yeast by literally creating fungicides from those good bacteria. They will actually create fungicides to keep the bacteria or the yeast in check. Colostrum has some data on clearing candida. I'm not big on just giving people colostrum, though, later in life. I don't know. It's kind of like we're already the only animal that eats dairy, right? I mean, the, beyond our, you know, the, the initial upbringing of our life, we're the only mammal that would actually consume dairy at a later point in life. I'm just asking, the essential oils for yeah. feeding, um, how much would you do? Um, normally, you can do, do this. So for this treatment? I would, I would make sure it's in a gel cap. In a gel cap, yep, and you do like, you know, these are like 75 milligrams of each kind of a thing per capsule, and you, you have to sort of titrate the dose with people. I give it with food because it can repeat on some folks, and so you just build the dose up real slowly over time, maybe up to like three of those caps three times a day. Three gel caps a day. Build up to three gel caps a day. I would start at three a day, one with each meal, and I'd build up to three with each meal. Okay. Yep. For, and, you know, just, just to, again, we're trying to clear the candida so we can start over. Uh, Scutellaria bicolensis. Thank you. Yes, I was in the in the hydrastis in the berberine category, um, and then die off. People can get die off with candida. They definitely can. And so you sometimes have to go slower with them if they're having. You know, they're getting headaches. They're getting kind of they're getting some depression. They're getting some low energy, memory loss, foggy headedness. Then you do have to definitely help and deal with that by just backing off their treatment and going a little bit slower with them. You had joint pain? Did it clear up for you after a while? Yeah, and sometimes you just got to get through it. Fermented foods. So, you know, fermented foods are great. There's, there's, they've been a part of our existence for a long time. Even things like beer and, you know, sauerkraut, cheese, yogurt, kimchi, miso, tempeh. And, you know, with some people, they can do a lot of fermented foods, even with candida, and it's good. Other people, you have to watch them. They can get, they can get some problems. So I just make it real specific for the individual. I normally pull, pull people off of most of these things um, if they're doing the yeast diet. But for most of my other diets, I like people to do some apple cider vinegar. I think that's a really good help. And a lot of sauerkraut. Sauerkraut's a really great way to reseed the, the bacteria in, in the body. Um, Little bits of yogurt. People always ask me if they can do yogurt. And I'm like, well, if you're just going to just do a little teeny bit, you know, don't just like eat a, you know, you get these big things of yogurt, these big cans, and just eat a whole can of yogurt. That's not, it's just so much dairy. It's so sticky and heavy. Um, kimchi, miso, tempeh, pickles. I mean, some people just love bread. They just can't get over bread. I mean, pretty much, it's kind of like the most amazing thing, right? We took the grains. It was like the thing that helped keep us from being migratory animals in the first place. We stored it, and then we ground it and processed it, and then we mixed it and made our dough, and then we baked it in our ovens, and we made our bread. And it's like we kind of like took our own creation, and we created bread. And it's amazing. It's magical. But, you know, a little bit goes a long way. Bread should be the thing that you have a little bit of and you carry your food on, not it should be the bulk of the meal. It doesn't make a difference as far as um, the lectins that are in those compounds that can be hard for people to digest if you're trying to reset their diet, but it does make a difference as far as the availability of nutrients. The availability of nutrients. Sprouted grains are generally a little bit easier to digest. A little, the nutrients are a little bit more alive. There's live, there's live enzymes with it. So here's the FODMAP diet, fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. This is a really cool diet. It really was being studied in Australia, in Monash University. Um, fructose, lactose, fructans, galactans, polyols. These are all these compounds that basically are hard for the body to digest. They're just, they're hard to digest. And so people started saying, well, what if we pulled these foods out of people's diets? They know that the, the FODMAPs are osmotic. They pull water into the t intestine, and they've been kind of blamed for having part of the, the irritable bowel diarrhea syndrome. And so a lot of the research that was done on the FODMAPs diet was to see how it was in, if they got people on this diet where they took out all these foods, all these the classes of foods, and they gave them this diet with IBS and see how their symptoms improved. And here's the diet in specific. 
It's just, just if you guys don't have this, again, I'm going to try to make this, all this available, these, these things, the slides that didn't show up, see if I can do that for you. Um, but here's all the, you know, the different, these are the richest source of FOB maps, and these are the alternatives. Um, they did the testing in Australia. They basically took people that had ileostomies, so they had a bag, they had an ileostomy bag, and they would actually t- watch what came out of their body after they took in the FODMAP foods. And they would see how these foods all related to digestion and how people were able to digest them or not digest them. And that's how they did a lot of their studies on these folks. They'd give them this stuff and then watch what came out and keep testing it. Um, Lactose and the lactase enzyme. Some people are lactose in, you know, intolerant. They, don't, they lack the lactase enzyme. That's one of the FODMAPs. Lactase is a disaccharide. Um, they would also look at the level of methane of people's breath, the breath hydrogen and methane test to, to see malabsorption of sugar. Um, these are basically, these foods, this component of them, the FODMAP component is generally a very small molecule that's fermentable by bacteria but isn't really well absorbed. So that was the reason they pulled it out to get these results. And they got some really impressive results. They had 86% of their patients in, with irritable bowel syndrome in the UK had improvement in their overall symptoms when they did the low FODMAP diet compared to traditional diet. And that's just for four, that's after just four weeks. And this diet has some real, it has some real benefit. I mean, it really does work. It's, it, the, the data is really strong. And I think for some people, it could be a helpful tool. But the other thing is, is that with this diet, there are some things that need to be considered because you're often getting a low fiber diet, which is because a lot of these are the fibers that we're talking about, these long polysaccharides. And with that, it can lead to constipation. It can slow down your bowel transit time. Also, the fact that these bugs, the microbiota, are acting on these compounds, they're actually creating metabolites that we need, and the microbiota themselves are being influenced by these compounds. So by having them in the body, it's changing our microbiota, and they found that people who are on this diet for long periods of time actually need probiotics in order to balance out their bowel system because they'll start to get an imbalanced biota because we've always had these foods in our bodies, and they should be a part of our diet. So you might want to basically, if you're working with people on this, on this FODMAPS diet, get them on it for a period of time, get them feeling a lot better, then start to slowly introduce little bits of FODMAPS back into their diet and see how they do. The GAPS diet I talked about, Natasha Campbell McBride, she was the one who looked at all these patients, there a lot of kids with autism, ADD, ADHD, obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, she looked at kids who had multiple neurological distress syndromes, and she basically started looking at the diet as the way to heal these people. And she created something called the GAPS diet, which is the gut and psychology syndrome diet. And in her patients, she said that almost 100% of the mothers of children with neurological or psychiatric conditions had clinical size of gut dysbiosis. Okay, almost 100%. Learning disabilities, psychiatric disorders, allergies, digestive problems. And what happened was in this modern patient they didn't get normal gut flora from the start. We described this right earlier. And then it got damaged even further by repeated courses of antibiotics and vaccinations. You know, and people get into the vaccine thing and they're like, well, vaccines cause autism. Well, I'm like, well, God, a lot of things cause autism. Not just vaccines. Sure, there's a link. If it damages your gut biota, it's going to cause a problem in your enteric nervous system. It's going to cause a problem in your brain. You're not going to feel good. Whether it's a vaccine, whether it's the immunological effects, whether it's the adjuvant you're taking, whether it's the antibiotics that you took as a kid, it doesn't matter. And most kids are getting all of it. So how do you isolate just the vaccine? I don't know. But I know it's another part of the picture. It's just that we're getting into this big debate about vaccines and everybody's so heated and nah, 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 about, you know, I'm like, let's just stop destroying the bugs and let's support them and love them and take care of them and let's shepherd them and farm them and we're going to get better. It's easy, right? So the GAPS diet has these principles, right? Heal and seal the gut lining, rebalance the immune system, restore the optimal bacterial ecosystem, avoid the processed foods, no packages, no tins. I just say avoid the center of the grocery store, just walk around the outside and just get the fresh foods. Just the, the whole center where all of the bright packaging with the bright colors and the big words and ah, it's like all jumping out at you. Just leave that stuff up behind. Go for the freshies. You know, you look at Europe, my wife's always telling me, when she would spend time in Europe, people go every day or every other day. They go to the market. They get fresh vegetables. They get fresh animal protein. They get fresh everything, even a little fresh bread that was just baked. And they are healthy, you know. Drink a bottle of wine, too. Hey, that was great. But they got really good food. Their biota was really strong. They weren't getting all this packaged crap. 
Balance of alkaline and acid food. So eating meats and vegetables together. Vegetables have an alkalization effect. Meats have a, a, an acidifying effect. Put them together and you balance the system. A lot of people get this really this big craze about alkaline foods, alkaline foods. I'm like, alkaline is just one side of the spectrum. Acid is just one side of the spectrum. We want the middle, right? Isn't that what we're trying to do? I mean, the body's not. People always go, I'm going to make my blood more alkaline. I'm like, no, you're not. Your blood's not going to change. It's 7.4. That's what's going to be. What's that? Yeah, right. Well, there's, what was that? Yeah, if you go beyond a small bit, you're going into the hospital, you know? So, so you just, just, you know, we want to alkalize a little bit. And there is, there is chronic, you know, acidic, it's called a chronic, what is it? Uh, met, met, uh, metabolic acidosis. And metabolic acidosis is when you're in a ton of stress and you burn up all of your buffer, your alkaline buffer, you need more alkaline buffer. So you can take some tri salts or sodium bicarbonate, you can do whatever you need to do, but you need to get more alkaline effect in your body and that's true a lot of people get to that point but for those of us who are trying to find really good balanced homeostasis we want to combine the meats and vegetables together eat the fruit separately it's a whole different digestive system right we want amylase we want to digest those sugars real simply and quickly we don't want to take them in while we're digesting all the meats and the vegetables and other things that are complex it's harder to break everything down when it's all together you create gas and food combining is a very important part of this whole thing Bone broth again, fermented foods, probiotics, EFAs, cod liver oil. Let's go to the ketogenic diet, right? So the ketogenic diet is basically shifting you over to eating fats. And you're eating a lot of fats. And the way that this works is it works by switching over the ATP process, improving mitochondrial function by making your body go move over towards a fat production, a beta oxidation of fats into pyruvic acid as the basic precursor for running the Krebs cycle, which is our beautiful, elegant way of cellular respiration to make energy, to make ATP. Normally, in, you know, for under stressful conditions, we'll run sugar through that system, and we basically, you know, we take the sugar through the, its little lactic acid generating cycle. We have to, we have to make pyruvic acid. We have to burn up a little energy to get a little energy, and we get a little bad of a byproduct. That leads to the same process, but it's really our immediate energy, fast energy, you need it now system. And it's nice to run off the fat system because when you beta oxidize the fat, you just chop it down into little bits, and there's no byproducts. There's no, you know, oxidative problem to deal with. And you can run those, that pyruvic acid right into the Krebs cycle. So the idea with this is you're improving mitochondrial function by shifting over to this starvation type of meta, meta, metabolism. And that was when the original research was done in starvation. And they did some work with um, epilepsy was the first thing that really showed that um, this diet was powerful. About 50% of people with epilepsy who did the ketogenic diet got cured. This was back in the early 1900s. Then other drugs came out, like Fitatuin and some other drugs that came out, and they started, again, the pharmaceutical companies kind of pushed it out of favor. But it's come back now as people dug and re realized the importance of it. It's also being researched in these diseases, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, Lou Gehrig's disease, traumatic brain injuries. It's great for the brain. The brain is all fats, you guys. The whole myelin system, all the myelin sheathing and all that stuff is all fats. So we need, fats are really good for the brain. If people have traumatic brain injuries, you give them EFAs. You give them lots of fatty acids. That's where the ketogenic diet can be really helpful for brain problems. It's great for glioblastomas. Always with my glioblastoma patients, get them on a ketogenic diet. It's the most aggressive brain cancer in the world. Here's what the diet looks like. 70 to 80% fats, avocado, coconut butter, milk and oil, butter, ghee, olive oil, sesame oil. You're just taking in a lot of fats all the time, nuts and seeds, protein, a little bit of organic free-range meats, and then just a little bit of complex carbs. That's just straight, just simply, just vegetables. Not starchy vegetables, but broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, you know, all the good stuff, the greens, kale, chard, spinach, you name it. People go on this diet for, you know, God, if you had cancer, you'd go on as long as you need to. You know, I've had people on it for a couple of years. But again, this is another diet that I would say is a short-term diet. The GAPS diet you can do for all, your whole life, no problem. That's a, that's a very great, it's a wonderful diet. And the ketogenic diet would be more like specific to get you out of your epilepsy. And then you could start varying it. But when you do the ketogenic diet, to do it right, you actually have to get a blood ketone meter because the urine tests aren't good enough because they only measure one of the three ketones that we make. And you need to measure all of them because you need to make sure that your ketone level is between one and three micromoles for optimal ketosis. That's why it's called the ketogenic diet. The, if you go into ketoacidosis, that's diabetic, too much ketone being produced due to high blood sugar, that's damaging to the body. That's up at like 10 micromoles. This level right here is this mild ketosis, and that's where we want to be, okay? And a lot of people I have, you got to supplement with, you got to take a little potassium with it too, just to make sure, because you can deplete potassium through the process. 
But when people are doing this diet, I often have them do this in the beginning, and then they can just stay with it. They don't need to keep measuring their blood and make sure it's all there. And they, can, they start to smell. They can tell a little bit of ketosis. They get a little bit of a smell in their sweet smell, something they get in their breath. You can, they can kind of they start to know what it's like to be in ketosis. So the paleo diet, really popular right now. It's, it's a great idea. Most people end up eating way too much meat. They kind of think of like the caveman, eat meat, you know, barbecue, and ah, you know, like that. That's not paleo, you know? Paleo is like scrounging around for seeds and ah, barks and nuts and, you know, we'll get some piece of a plant and, oh, an animal, oh, I got a little piece, that's a squirrel, you know? That's, that's a paleo diet, you know? Um, so we need to, we, it needs to be kind of reevaluated, I think, on the sense of what we're doing with this thing. But it's a cool concept. My diet is here. This is um, 60 to 70 percent vegetables. I'm like a vegetable diet kind of guy, and I like some proteins and fats. And I like animal proteins. I'm just I'm a free range vegetarian. I was vegetarian and went to free range vegetarian, which means that I eat animals, but I eat them only if they're free range or organic, and if they're non hormones and non antibiotics. It's more about the treatment of the animal than anything. I don't want to eat animals that have been tortured and beaten. I just can't do it. it doesn't work for me. So. Here's my vegetables and grains and seafoods and sauerkrauts for superfoods and berries. Berries are fantastic. It's a great source of energy and food for people. Low glycemic load on the body, which is really important. Um, meats, like organic free-range meats and uh, the wild games and you know, wild fish and eggs. Fish is great. You just, and the thing with protein, I just tell my patients, vary your sources. Just don't keep eating the same fish out of the same river. That's the problem. If that river has a problem, lead or mercury or something, you're getting it every time. So don't eat from that place. Eat some goat from the goat farm up the road. Eat some elk from over here. Eat some fish from over in this part of the country. Eat some turkey from over here. Just keep varying it. Then you won't get the concentrated toxins that we're dealing with in all the different locales. Here's my elimination diet. You, can discuss, you guys can have this stuff. The basic premise is, you know, and this is instead of doing like an IgE allergy test, which I don't find to be exceptionally useful. My elimination diet work has done a lot better for me and just, just with patients. Um, things that you can eat on the diet. That's what people always ask me whenever I'm trying to switch their diet. And I'm, I'm the kind of guy who's like, okay, you got pain in your hip. Cool, we, I'll treat you. No, it didn't get better. Okay, tell you what, three weeks, my diet. Three weeks. And then I'll see you after that. We'll see how you're doing. And people are like, oh, I don't know how that could connect. And I'm like, oh, okay, we'll see how it connects. And then eventually they're like, wow, my pain's gone. You know? And it's just a really cool thing to be able to do. Um, but they always ask me, what can I eat? You took away all these foods, you know, the wheat, dairy, corn, soy, nuts, seeds, chips, pumpkin. And then they're like, what, what can I eat? And I'm like, well, you, you know, you just got to start giving people resources as far as good diet books and recipes and things like that. And, of course, my wife, I keep telling her, make the diet book. Get the book together. Come on. She's got all these amazing recipes. We don't have the book yet. So, um, Herbal teas, lemon or basil water. It's just simple stuff, you know. Sometimes I have people do a little bit of mineral water if they want something exciting like a Gerol Steiner or something, like a spring, a, a spring water, just so it's kind of bubbly and they can mix it with a little bit of lemon or lime and just have something that's interesting in their life. Because people often are used to like popping and super flavors and super sweet and super strong. And these diets are generally not like that. They're kind of like they just take all that and tone it way down. So for the elimination diet, right, you do three weeks on the diet where you eliminate all those things and then at the end of three weeks, you introduce a food, a food that you want to try. Let's say, I mean, I just want bread so bad. You're like, okay, cool. On the first day after your three weeks off of all the foods, you eat bread. And you, you, know, you have bread for breakfast. You eat toast. Then at lunch, you're going to have more bread. You have a sandwich. And all you know, dinner, you have more bread. And you see how do you feel at the end of that day. And you assess for all kinds of symptoms, headaches, depression. You know, did you get heart palpitations? Do you feel low energy? Does your memory get foggy? What, what happened? And then... If there's no problems, if you feel great on eight pieces of bread that day, cool, you can eat bread. But if you didn't feel good, if anything happened, then you've got to wait three days before you introduce another food. If you went through that day and you had no problems and you can eat wheat now, then that's a part of your diet. And the next day you introduce another food. So you go do dairy. So you wake up in the morning, you drink a glass of milk. You go to lunch. At lunch, you have a big, you know, a big cheese something or other, you know. At dinner, you eat the same thing. But you've got to eat a lot of that substance to really get the effect. So bone broth. Bone broth is amazing. We love it. It's got to be quick, man. I'm out of time. Quick. How many days between testing each food? Three. If you have a reaction, wait three days. If no reaction, you can start the next day. No, you can keep that food. Once, once you've introduced a food and you have no reaction, then that's, just a, that's like a part of your diet now. But be an astute scholar. 
really notice, because even a little bit of a symptom means that you're having some kind of reaction to that food. And, it's a, and you can have a low-grade reaction that's just you know, undermining your ability to have perfect health every day, and you want to get rid of that thing. So minerals, collagen and gelatin, you know, um, hyaluronic acid, the, the glycosaminoglycans, amino acids like glycine and proline, these are the structures of our joints, the structures of our synovial fluids. That, that's the biochemical analysis. The traditional idea was that it was a way to replenish your marrow, your essence, and your blood. It's very nourishing, and it's very digestible, you guys. Broths are amazing. Broths. People can heal on broths. I often have people just when they're really sick and they're really going through it, I just, baby food and broths, that's it. Just, you know, pure, pureed kind of good whole food that you, and not raw foods. Like people always want to do the raw food thing. I'm like, raw foods are hard on us. We really need to take foods and just gently get them more digestible. It can be hard to digest cold raw foods. Glycosaminoglycans. It's chondroitin sulfate, methyl sulfonyl methane, and uh, glucosamine. So how we eat? It's a Miyagi. You catch a fly with your chopstick. Um, chewing our food. In the Taoist idea of food, you should be able to chew your food until it tastes sweet. Some, some people say chew it for 100 chews. Don't read or watch TV while you eat. Focus on eating. Focus on eating. Prepare your own food. Nourish the hearth. Nourish your digestive tract. Eat good food. Calm the nervous system. Here's some just beautiful techniques. Just being in nature. Just calm the nervous system down. Allow the digestive system to do its job and rest and relax. Now, this is simple stuff, but this is big stuff. This is the big stuff that makes you a great practitioner versus an, a decent practitioner. So botanical medicine, perfectly suited to maintain ecological stability. Why? Because you're changing the ecosystem. You're changing the terrain in the body by using plants. You're getting rid of the pathological factors from the ecological, from the macroecological perspective. You have an imbalanced ecosystem. Plants will balance the ecosystem. You know, you have a, is this plant hot or cold? What's ginger? Is ginger hot or cold? It's hot, right? So if a person has a hot condition, you give them ginger? What, if, what about turmeric? Is turmeric hot or cold? It's warm. It's warm. So it's not the best anti-inflammatory. It's just in the limelight right now. Everybody's like, turmeric! But you know what? There's a lot of great plants that are great and better than turmeric at a lot of things. So again, if you apply the macroecological perspective, turmeric's not great for everybody with inflammation. So I'm going to talk about a guy. This guy is called Li Dongyuan, Li Gao, and he's, he founded this thing called the Earth School. He, but when he was alive, he was, and the Earth School was, you know, was like, idea was focus on the Earth, right? Focus on the spleen and stomach. And his whole concept was don't just clear away pathological factors, which had been kind of the approach for the first like 1,400 years of traditional Chinese medicine. He was saying, well, we need to build the spleen and stomach. We need to support people. We need to build them up. And so he was living in a very war torn, ravaged, nutrient deficient culture, and people were kind of emaciated. They were overworked. They were poor. So what he did is he gave them herbs to strengthen their spleen and stomach, and he helped them. And he learned how to do this, and he really got this is what, so he developed a whole school of thought around building people up just by whatever their disease is, whatever their problem is. Let's get their spleen and digestion working again. And once he did that, he saw people get well. Of course, that that was his society, but we have a little different issue. We have a similar thing. We're not war ravaged. We're not you know deficient in nutrients. We're over nutrient. We have too much, too much sweetness too much goodness, too much of a good thing. And so we're more sticky and damp and gooey rather than weak and emaciated and deficient. But the result is actually the same because all that sweet goodness clogs up your digestive system. And the clogging does the same thing. It impairs your ability to absorb the nutrients, get them into the bloodstream, and get it to where it needs to go. Thanks, Ligo. So Bujong Ichi Tong, this is a formula. Tonify the middle to augment the chi. Some herbs you might recognize, the astragalus and ginseng, a great combination. I love ginseng. I mean, that plant is amazing. It's one of my all-time favorite plants, Korean ginseng. That plant is phenomenal. It does so much. It lifts the spleen energy. It strengthens the digestion. It strengthens the kidney. It supports the body. It's like, you know, it, it calms the nervous system. It's amazing. It's a little warm for some people, though, so watch that. And you can always go to the white ginseng if they're warm. Just to, that's a little bit cooler. A, Yes. Dried? This would be dried herb. It's a root. Radix and radix. So 9 to 12 grams. This would be dried herbs. And you, what you do is you take this formula, you'd cook this all down into 
um, of an effluent, and then you would drink it over two days. Attractylodes, this plant, I love this plant. It's tonifying to the spleen, but it's clearing of dampness. Okay, and I'm just going to jump forward here. Ooh, I almost gave you guys my favorite slide. Um, this is the TCM spleen. I want to go a little into detail on this, okay? So the spleen, and, like I said earlier, that the spleen and stomach geographically represent a high mountain lake for the stomach and a low spleen, like a, a lowland pond for the spleen, okay? The spleen likes to be damp, likes to be moist. It likes to be, like, it's like, imagine all the fluids and everything that's in the small intestine. It's being absorbing nutrients. It wants there to be moisture there. And a pond is the example that the ancient Chinese Taoist doctors used to exemplify the spleen's function. Water's flowing in and out of the pond. There's beautiful things happening. Look at there's lily pads and there's bugs, there's dragonflies and you know everything's there's little fish and tadpoles and the pond is functioning in a really integrated, beautiful way. Now, if you suddenly take and you pour silt down those streams, like heavy, rich alluvial earth, and just so running it into that pond, it gets clogged and it gets too rich and it gets starts to get to be this stinky bog eventually, where you start getting bur- gurgling, blah, 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 and there's bugs and there's midges, and there's mosquitoes, and the whole thing changes into a very dysfunctional place where you put more nutrient into it and it just gets bleh, it just gets stuck, it just clogged. Whereas in this clean, clear spleen. Water goes in and nutrients come in and all the things eat it up and digest it and share it and it's moving through and it's just like everything is in flow and it's really clear and clean. So what makes the spleen go from this to what I was describing just a minute ago? Well, I just love that guy. This guy right here ate too much sweet food. And he's kind of bloated. And he doesn't feel good at all. So spleen deficiency with dampness. That's what we're dealing with, okay? Bloating, gas, distension, cramping, belching, heartburn, primarily after eating, fatigue, loss of energy. This is when people, when the spleen is clogged because you've given, you've, over time you've eaten too much of the stuff that's sweet and gooey, processed and broken down into sugars quickly, you end up with this picture where the spleen, the digestive tract, is deficient. Imagine what's going on to the bugs in there. Now you've got all this, this, this dysbiota, dysbiota that's happening, and it's not supporting you getting the nutrients you need anymore. Even though you may look plump, you're not healthy. So here's a formula that's more directed at the dampness in the spleen. I can go back here too. Let's see, what did I... I wanted to go to these common patterns, so I'll do this first. Um, spleen chi deficiency with damp. And we saw the tongue, right? That's the puffy tongue with the scallops. That's the person who's having the foggy headedness and they're kind of, the muscle energy is weak. They're kind of heavy. They don't want to get up and do stuff. That's the spleen deficient person. And then the dampness is even more heavy and more sticky and, and you get bowel problems, bloating, gas, cramping, fullness, distension, acid regurgitation, heartburn. Then the phlegm damp syndrome, this is even a deeper kind of layer where there's just, the dampness is actually cooked into an even more viscous form of turbidity called phlegm. And the phlegm is then in your bodies. And we can almost pick this up as you can start to see high cholesterol levels and low density lipids and things start to change in the bloodstream that are associated with this phlegmy picture. People have, you know, the beginnings of, of type 2 diabetes, for example, is a great example of a lot of people with phlegm dampness. Um, and then liver chi stagnation li- leading to wood overacting on the earth pattern where the liver becomes stagnant and then the liver stagnation actually makes the spleen and stomach weaker. And then we have kidney adrenal deficiency, which we kind of hit earlier. These are the big patterns in the clinic that I see a lot relating to this, this process of looking at the enteric nervous system. So I'm going to go, go back here to this Leo Junzawan. This is a formula... Um, that deals with both the deficiency of the spleen and also with the dampness. It combines these two formulas. One is the ginseng and the tractylodes, again, those two, those two herbs. And this is a formula that was developed originally by the Li Gao. The poria coccus, that's the fooling, that's the mushroom. And that's a, the, the poria is really nice because it gently tonifies the spleen as it drains away the dampness. It kind of creates a, a system of canals and rivers to get rid of the damp energy in the spleen and the digestive tract. The turbidity there moves it out. Uh, the, the licorice, licorice has got a lot of benefits for the body. Um, it's a harmonizer. It's gently spleen tonifying. It gets rid of toxicity of other herbs. And we've got citrus peel for resolving dampness. And then this is penelia. And penelia is an herb that's prepared in a very special way, but it, it also really clears up phlegm. It's very drying. 
phlegm resolving. So we want to get rid of the phlegm, tonify the spleen to make the person feel a lot better. The, rea- the actions here are strengthening the spleen, transforming phlegm, drying dampness, directing the chi down, removing obstruction in the middle burner. One of the concepts about the middle burner is that the spleen is like, it has a pot underneath. It's like a pot of stew, right? In the middle of the the yurt, in the center of the village, there's this little fire that's burning. And the fire keeps cooking the stew into this perfect mix of nutrition that that the old woman is just always putting the most perfect foods into, just making it perfect. Well, that fire needs to be strong enough to keep that stuff warm and keep churning it. When the fire gets diminished, it gets weakened, the, the stew starts to get stale. And that's what happens in this this picture with all this dampness and gooiness. The middle burner gets obstructed and it's not strong enough to heat up the food, move the fluids, and do the digestion. Some modifications to this. You add the Auklandia. This is an herb that really helps to resolve the, the, um, the dampness even more and helps to move the energy for people with more bloating and gas and that kind of stuff, cramping. It really helps to move it along for them and clears that up. Um, we have the Sha Ren. This is a, the Amomum fruit, which is like a Chinese cardamom. And you can use cardamom as well. I, in this next slide, I've talked about some of the other herbs, or yeah, the, the kind of spices and things we can use. And then I put Huang Lian, that's Coptis. This is, there's a Huang Lian Liu Junzitong, which is where you combine this six herb formula with the Coptis, and you get a, a way to clear some of that dampness and the heat out of a patient that might have more of a heat picture while tonifying their spleen and draining damp. More botanicals. Herbs to drain dampness, and then herbs to regulate the chi in the middle jiao. These are herbs that are more moving to the energy. They're like, like imagine you wanted to dry out your clothes on a, on a day that there wasn't much sun. Well, you could, you know, if there was if there was sun, it'd be heat, right? You bring in hot herbs. You could bring like dried ginger and cinnamon and things like that to to dry things out with heat. And the idea of the, you know, there wasn't a sun. If there was no sun that day, but you wanted to dry things out, well, you want to create like a breeze. If there was a breeze coming by that day, it would still dry your clothes, even though it wasn't a hot day. The breeze will also do some drying. And so these kind of are some of the things that transform dampness without being so heating. They can really do some of this job of drying up the damp without being drying to the system. These are really cool additions. I have a lot of people who have that kind of phlegm, dampy, their digestive system is just really off, and they've got the fogginess, they've got the heaviness. They're just not feeling really very good. They're not feeling, like, alive. They want to go run around and play in their earth body. Those people, I like to give them these types of herbs. Orange people, peel, ginger, licorice, cardamom, fennel, fenugreek, cinnamon, and peppermint. These are all aromatic herbs that transform dampness. They uplift the spirits by clearing away some of the turbidity in the digestive tract. Imagine how all these herbs are affecting the microbiota and making the microbiota happier, stronger, more resilient, more diverse. Here's some herbs that tonify the spleen. These are, and, and one thing about tonifying the spleen, I just want to say, is that when you tonify the spleen, you do it in a way, in a person who's like already got the dampness going on, you can't give them just tonics, tonics. The tonics will like just be like that image I said, you're putting in too much silt into that pond and it's getting gooey. Sometimes you need to actually move some of the energy, open up some of the waterways, transform some of the dampness so that the, the, the new nutrients coming in can tonify the system without making it more cloying, without making it more sticky and rich, because they're sweet in their nature tonifying herbs. Sweet is a tonifying flavor. So let's talk about the liver for a minute. So the liver, as a part of the digestive system, the liver is amazing. I talked about how the whole mesenteric venous system, right, from the intestines, drains back up through the hepatic portal vein into the liver, and all that blood is metabolized. So the liver being a central theme in Chinese medicine and in traditional medical thought, its, its role is to metabolize the life experience. And it's really big in emotions. It it's, has a huge role in our emotions. And the liver wants to grow outwardly. It wants to express itself. It wants artistic and creative output. It, wants to, it, it, creates, it generates the flow of energy through your body, through your hands, through your feet. It extends your chi outwardly. It's, it's the wood elements, like all the things that grow on in this place out here. Like this is a very livery place. There's a lot of wood here. And when the wood is constrained due to emotional strain, due to obstructions, due, you know, it, like we talked about earlier today, like your mom dying or something like that, it's a big emotional burden on the liver, the anger and frustration that comes up with that. Those things all affect the liver's ability to do the things that it likes to do, like be creative, like dredge and discharge all the stuff that you want to get rid of, like work through all the toxins, whether they be emotional toxins or physical toxins. 
It opens into the eyes, always looking for liver, for liver problems when there are eye issues. Things like, you know, and the liver's job is to detoxify, right? So when we get into the eyes, you have very fine machinery there that breaks down when the liver is worn out and can't detoxify. Retinal detachment, macular degeneration, cataracts. These are all oxidative damage related conditions. In charge of planning and strategy, ruling the tendons. And what happens when the liver gets stagnant? Well, you look like our friend here. You get upset, angry, depressed, and frustrated, and irritable. Damn it. Cold hands and feet. It's a great way to differentiate a cold syndrome from a liver stagnation syndrome. Liver stagnation syndromes have cold hands and feet, whereas cold syndromes have cold body core. If a person really needs warmth, they'll be cold in the core. If they need their liver to be moved and get that energy flowing, then their hands and feet will be cold, but they'll be normal in their body. It's that inability of the liver's energy to move outward. So the liver energy, big part of menstrual problems, and you know, a lot of people have menstrual problems, they have digestive problems too. The, the moon comes, blood's supposed to flow, and <laughs> it doesn't flow, it's stuck, oh, I'm bloated, oh, my back hurts, oh, this, oh God, I'm, just, I'm irritated. That whole, that's all liver related, that's the liver's energy. And then when that liver energy is stagnant and backed up, it overacts onto the spleen and stomach. Here's our pond with a lot of wood in it, right? So the wood is overgrown, over into this pond, it's overgrown on our earth, and it's, it's going to be this pattern, liver stagnation with spleen sheet deficiency, is where the liver actually overacts on the spleen. So if the spleen is weak and deficient to start with, well, the liver is already going to be like overpowering the spleen. But then if the liver is really upset and backed up, then it's going to beat up even a healthy spleen. And this is the Chinese way of looking at irritable bowel syndrome. You always treat the liver. This is from Essentials from the Golden Cabinet. This is a the Jin Gui Yao Lui, a very important text in Chinese medicine. When one sees a liver disorder, one knows that the liver will transmit it to the spleen. Therefore, one should treat the spleen. So, careful with, you know, you see this thing, when people are irritated and upset and they've got the liver thing, support their spleen and soothe their liver. That's the process. And this, the, it's just such a beautiful system and it works so well. This formula, Xiaoya Wan, Free and Easy Wanderer, it's a classic formula. It's the rambling powder. It's sort of the idea is that like with this formula, it frees your mind up from worry. It kind of like lets you kind of see the world from a different perspective and let go of all the ways that you thought you saw it and all the things that kind of keep your mind focused on what it's always focused on. And it relieves that. And the herbs are all here. This is again, this is a formula that you would combine as whole herbs. You'd cook them in a decoction, and then the decoction would be drank over one or two days, depending on the person's condition. Bupleurum and, and angelica. Angelica moves blood and tonifies blood. Bupleurum is a really nice herb that actually does, it courses the liver, and it lifts the energy. One thing about the spleen, we're back to that, when the digestion is weak, everything starts to sink. The body starts to sink. That's that heaviness. The muscle energy starts to get waning, and everything starts to get depleted. When you lift the spleen energy and you get it strong again, everything feels better. Everything gets vital. Muscles get stronger. All, you know, it's like visceral pro prolapses, right? Like people having prolapsed organs and things. That's a spleen digestive system related deficiency. We tonify that spleen area, and we lift those things up over time. This, for, this formula, what it does is it harmonizes the liver and the spleen while also soothing the liver, strengthening the spleen, getting rid of some dampness a little bit, and nourishing the liver blood. This formula is so great. Xiao Ya Wan. And this comes in tea pills, too. If you're looking for something to give for these liver patients, this is a great formula for those folks. And in tea pills, it's like 12 to 15 of those tea pills two or three times a day for folks is very, very safe and very, very helpful to help move that liver energy. It's great for menstrual stuff, great for these IBS problems, and it deals with the gut in a, in a very harmonious way. And this is a couple of additions um, for cooling the formula down. Gardenia flower and radix mutan, these herbs both cool down the formula and make it even better for relieving heat in the, in the body. Here's some liver botanicals. And these three herbs right here, ginger, jujube, and licorice, can go in almost any formula. They're just so good for harmonizing the digestion. The jujube date is a really nice one. It tonifies the spleen and nourishes the blood a little bit, but it's real gentle. It's like a food medicine. It's right on that edge. The licorice, another one I said, like I said, it tonifies the spleen, it gets rid of toxicity, it harmonizes other herbs in the formula, it's used in a lot of formulas, and it's a spleen tonic. Ginger, fresh ginger, 
You could add that to a lot of formulas. People do herbs, they're making an herbal formula. Have them get some fresh sugar, cut it up and put it in. It just helps the digestion. Of course, if they're really hot, it's not a great thing for them. But for most people, a little bit of ginger goes a long way. It helps digest the formula. It deals with nausea, keeps the digestion moving in a smooth way. Here's a few spotlight herbs. I talked about, you know, this is Coptis, Huang Lian. Um, it's bitter and cold. It's got a high LV50. Um, that was for you. It's, it enters the stomach, the liver, and the colon, the heart, and it really clears out damp heat, relieves toxins, and regenerates tissue. This herb really, you know, is one that I love. It's, it's, it's so bitter, and it's so nasty. It's like right there with gentian, you know? Gentian and, and coptis are like both just so bitter. Oh, and um, andrographis. Those are like the bitters, kings of bitters. Um, but that bitter flavor clears away heat. That's what it does. It drains fire. Bitter f- drains fire. So I'm always trying to encourage my patients, let's move away from a sweet tooth into a bitter tooth. They're like, you're crazy. I'm like, look, look, look. You got people out there that can't wait to the end of the day that they can smoke a cigar and drink a glass of scotch. They love that. That's their favorite thing ever. They get dopamine from that. They probably get serotonin from that. And they think it tastes great. But when they were five years old, they would have hated that stuff. So life is an acquired taste. So I just, you just got to start shifting over bit by bit to how you want it to be. And then the bugs will start to shift with you. And then your tastes will change and your brain will change and it'll all shift. But we have to make changes to this very um, adaptable system of ours. These T-pills, Huang Lian Su Wan, this is a great formula. This, it actually helps to regenerate tissue. So for those ulcers, for H. pylori, it's really good in those conditions. Um, and Coptis also, if it comes from certain parts of China, it has a really powerful regenerative quality on the tissue in the, in the stomach. It can regenerate ulcers. When I was in China, we would actually study um, with these really famous doctors and sit with them, and they would bring in patients. We'd see them, we'd do an intake and say, oh, what's the condition? Oh, it looks like they've got a spleen sheet deficiency. What's the, there's some kind of heat there too. You know, we don't know what's really going on. They might have an ulcer. Let's send them down for a scan or for an endoscope. And then so the patient would leave, go down to the endoscope. We'd talk to the doctor. He said, what kind of formula? I'd say, oh, let's give them this formula with these ideas. He goes, oh, that's a great idea, great idea. The next person comes in. Then an hour later, that original person comes in. They bring in, they've got, here's a picture of my stomach. And there's an ulcer there. Oh, there's an ulcer. Okay, well, I like that formula you did before, but let's add some coptis to it to regenerate that tissue around that ulcer and cool it down. It's like, really, we could do that? We could just like have a conversation about this patient, get the full pattern diagnosis, and then they go down the hall and they put a scope in their stomach and you say, oh yeah, there is an ulcer, and then you've got the picture? I was like, this is amazing. And this was 10, 12 years ago, you know? The last line of the previous slide. Yes, sir. Dose, 12 to 20 T-pills, twice, yeah. T-pills are about 200 milligrams. They're small, round balls that have already been previously decocted. So it's coptis that's already prepared. It's a really nice way to go. Gentle, easy. It works great. Great for infections in the stomach. Ling jur, that's the spirit mushroom. This is reishi, right? Ganoderma lucidum. Ling jur means spirit mushroom. Ling is, the, is the, the Chinese character for spirit. It's two people under a tree praying for rain. And this herb is like magic. It tonifies the chi of the body, nourishes the yin and the blood, strengthens the spleen and stomach, calms the mind and the shen, all the things that I want to do here. You can combine it with ginseng, astragalus, angelica for people who are overworked. I mean, this herb, remember that medicinal mushrooms are bioremediators. That's what they do. They bioremediate our ecosystems. You know, people like Paul Stamets are going out there putting mushrooms into streams and stuff to kind of help them clear the streams. You find that mushrooms absorb toxins. They do that. They also help our immune system. They give us some support, and they clarify that dampness. They try. They, they really help clarify turbidity in the system. When you're extracting Ganoderma, just put some things you want to make sure you get a high polysaccharide concentration, and do always try to get stuff that's extracted in the traditional fashion, which means it's soaked for an hour, cooked for 35 minutes, poured off and cooked again for 15 minutes, and then you get all the polysaccharides in there. Nowadays, a lot of people are also doing an alcohol extraction at the end of it to just like increase the triterpenes. And if you can get one with a 4% triterpene extract, that's even better. Dose at 3 to 6 grams a day. That's a nice, good dose of reishi. People will feel better on it. And can I, can I get mushrooms to people who have yeast infections? Yes. Yes. St. John's wort. Love this plant. It's so perfect for this talk because it's a neurological adaptant. It heals the nervous system, addresses depression and mood, 
restores the, restores the neurological system. The best thing for damage, like for people recovering from you know, post-herpetic stuff, it's amazing for so many neurological problems. You can dose it really high. It is not the, the, the black sheep of, med, of herbal medicine as everybody thought it was. It just has this ability through the pregnant X receptor, through this one receptor, to really affect the way that the liver metabolizes all the compounds. It directs these enzyme pathways, which is why it helps clear toxins out of the body. And where it got into trouble is because it helps a lot of drugs get cleared quickly through the liver. It increases their metabolic rate. So drug levels go down. Well, as long as you know that and you know what drugs a person's taking, then you're good. It's not a bad herb. It just has gotten a bad rap. But look, it's always thought of an SSRI related drug, right? Like a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, but it's not. It just works real specifically, and it does have an effect on serotonin. It is actually shown to inhibit biofilms. It can break down biofilms, so if you need to get rid of a certain bacteria, it's dysbiotic. And it's just, it's like a magical herb. It also has a profound effect on adaptation, and so for the HPA axis. So don't forget about hypericum when you're thinking about digestive stuff and when it's connection to the neurological health of the patient. Some specific solutions. I just want to get through these last couple, you guys. I know it's, it's about five, it's about nine after five. You guys okay for just a couple minutes? It's a couple cool things here. Okay. Okay, good. So I love this blend right here. It's so cool. Bentonite clay, psyllium, and aloe. The, the bentonite clay has the montmorillonite in it, which is an adsorbent compound, right? So it pulls strongly negative or positive ions to it. So it basically pulls a lot of charged things out of the body, which is why people always think of it as a detoxification supplement or as a detoxification agent. It, it does that, but it also will pull viruses. They, they're very charged. It'll pull bacteria onto it. And it doesn't select which ones it pulls. It'll pull all of them, any ones that come in contact with it. Of course, biofilms protect them from electromagnetic pulls and things, so established colonies won't get affected. But it's a really good way to pull some stuff out of the, of the digestive tract, and you can always replenish things later, like I said, just by eating a really good diet, getting the live enzymes and the good bugs in the foods, get you know a little bit of soil on your food even. Those things will all help. But I have people often do this when they have diarrhea. If I, if I don't know why they have diarrhea and they're having really severe diarrhea, I want to figure it out. First thing I want to do is get that diarrhea to stop. This combo right here. Bentonite clay. I do a half to one teaspoon. Whole psyllium seed. This is not psyllium husk. And I've had this work excellent in ulcerative colitis. This mix right here, people with diarrhea and ulcerative colitis. Aloe powder, one teaspoon. And aloe powder, there's one company called Buy Aloe that makes this one type of um, aloe powder that has a high enough concentration of asamanin that even Donnie Yance likes it. <laughs> and and uh, it's very soothing to the gut lining, very rebuilding. Aloe is amazing. Aloe is antimicrobial. It's, you know, I mean, it, it, does, it, it kills staph and strep. It has this, it, it's a full demulsant. It regenerates the mucus lining in the body and the, the GI tract. And when you combine these three together, it basically can, makes this like conglomerate that moves slowly through the bowel like a gel and slows everything down, pulls away the dysbiotic stuff, replenishes the mucus lining, and forms a stool. And it's really remarkable. You can do this for folks. It's not your end solution, but it's your middle road. It's your way to get through. And I've had a bunch of times in my life where I just like ate some bad food, had diarrhea, took that stuff two or three times, and boom, I was done. Diarrhea gone. I've done it with a lot of people. Question? Do you ever do it as a retention I haven't. Have you? Similar, not the clay. Not the clay? But the aloe and the psyllium seed? You soak the psyllium seed first and get it nice and gelatinous. Yeah, when you soak the seed, um, about five minutes and 10 to 12 ounces of water, you'll get the seed will swell up and it'll just become like a jelly. You don't have to worry about the seeds aren't going to be like diverticulum irritating because they're all just nestled in this jelly. And the jelly then, is, you, you mix in the, the other stuff later, the psyllium and, and, I'm sorry, the aloe and the bentonite and just get it all into a slurry and then just have to drink it down. The texture is not great, but the flavor is fine. It's just the texture is, is a little tough. Um, then what I do is, as the diarrhea changes, if a person's taking this, and I like it for the fiber, this kind of like this, this demulcent, gelatinous effect, then I can always take the bentonite clay out after the diarrhea gets controlled. And you can also change the dose. I'm just, if, if you increase the bentonite clay, you're going to decrease bowel transit. And if you increase the bentonite clay, you're going to decrease bowel transit. Did I say that right? More clay means less bowel movements, and less clay means more. I got two questions. You're first. Yeah, 
Charcoal would work in a very similar way. And, and like if people had like a real like a severe C. diff or E. coli, I'd use this and I'd have them do charcoal as well. And I'd probably have them do some Saccharomyces boulardii and do some other probiotics. Yep, exactly. The mechanism for the bentonite clay yeah. is the silica that's in there. It's like a pane of glass. And that pane of glass on the sides, great surface area, negatively charged. On the edges, positively mm -hmm. So it will pull out your positively charged organisms, uh -huh. which are most of the offenders. Okay. And it's like selective to that because of its configuration. So it doesn't charge, it won't pull negative charge to those ends? On the outside? Just the, just just the, the ends? You know, like it, it seems pretty universal. It doesn't seem to select one way or the other, you know? Yeah, I like that. You don't have to worry about it. It's safe. Okay. Um, glutamine is another addition to this, too. You can add some glutamine in there, too, for folks who need a little bit more of that secretory IgA support and fuel for the cells and neurological support in the, in the GI tract. So some leaky gut solutions. So we talked a lot about leaky gut. We went through that whole process of how that looks and how that goes. Yes, sir? Not the husk. The husk doesn't have the gelatinous part. The husks are like a broom, like a sweeper. Like if you want to clear the colon and cleanse things out, it's really good at that, the husks are. But this is really gentle and it's just soothing. So folks who have like irritable um, tissue, like if they have colitis or they have Crohn's disease or something, I won't ever use the, the husks because it's really rough. And that roughness can be hard on the tissue. And for a really delicate, inflamed, friable tissue, you want something soft and soothing. And that's why I use the seed, the whole seed. I wouldn't substitute it. I wouldn't substitute it, but I could use charcoal as additionally. I use, I use it in capsules generally because people don't like to take it. But you could take a couple caps twice a day, you know, two charcoal caps twice a day to help you know, absorb some of those toxins and reduce diarrhea. It'd be great in those you know, difficult C. diff cases. Can you substitute flat seed for You could, but it's not going to be the same. It's not going to be the same. You know, it's not quite as gelatinous. But flaxseed has a lot of the similar properties. It's kind of mucilaginous like that. Um, I always tend to uh, grind up the flaxseeds. I don't know. I, th I think what would happen is the flaxseeds wouldn't take up the flu water. They wouldn't gel up. They, you'd, need to, you'd need to grind them first, and then I'm not sure if they'd work the same. They would absorb the water. They would absorb the water. Yeah, the, the flaxseeds are really great, though, for, you know, like flaxseed powder, just for helping, you know, be a nice fiber. And they do help move the bowels. They create a nice, you know, gentle FODMAP effect. Yeah, chia would be very similar. Yep, a nice, and, and I think oftentimes, like, I don't like people to do a lot of nuts and seeds when they're doing, like, restorative digestive tract work because the nuts and seeds are kind of hard to digest. A lot of them have molds on them, especially the nuts if they've been sitting around. I mean, you know, originally we used to eat nuts, right? You'd get a walnut or you get a Brazil nut. It's always in a husk, and you have to break the shell, and then you get at the nut, and the nut's fresh. It's been out of the, it's been out of the heat and out of the light, so it's not all, and it hasn't been affected by molds and things. It's protected. Nowadays, we break them all open and throw them in a bag and ship them all over the place, and then I'm like, what am I getting here? You know, then it's ground into butter, and then that's mixed around, and it's, I bet you there's just a lot of molds in that stuff. So people who are real sensitive have to be careful with that. And then also, it's just kind of hard to digest. It's hard on the ileocecal valve. It's hard on the, you know, again, like delicate tissues. When they're irritated, nuts and seeds can be hard. There are big chunks of them going through there, getting rubbing against the tissue with the peristalsis. I just think that it's, it's important to pull them out for a little while. I often leave in the chia seeds, though, and the flax seeds, you know, if they grind them up. And hemp seeds are often okay. Um, sesame seeds sometimes, if they're like, you know, sesame butter, they make it themselves. Those kind of things are okay if they need more options. So leaky gut stuff here. Um, decrease intestinal permeability. We've got calf's claw up there. Uh, David Winston was talking about that like uh, down in Arizona. He was just talking about how amazing calf's claw is for improving the gut. Uh, I'm sorry, the, um, what are we talking about here? We're talking about the leaky gut. We're talking about the lumen of, lumen of the intestines. See you later, man. Take care. And um, <clears throat> So it's got a big effect on the immune system for sure, and it's regulating the immune function, which is also regulating the gut lining, which is also regulating those cells. So I think that there's a big part of it that's in that realm, but that's definitely one option for helping with leaky gut. Um, glutamine, we talked about. The glycosaminoglycans help to repair the mucus lining. They're structural component for the epithelium, and they're good at repairing the tight junctions, the tight gap junctions. Hyaluronic acid, this is another compound that I really like. It's very similar to the GAGs. It might actually be considered a GAGS. 
Um, it's hyaluronic acid is part of the synovial fluid in our joints. It's very nourishing and it plumps up tissues. It's a good one again to help build the mucus lining. You've got slippery and slimy stuff like ulcer herbs and demulcents. They're really great for building up the, the, the GI lining for the mucus lining. Um, Allantoin, which is a product, something that comes from comfrey. If you remember that, it's that sticky, gooey part of comfrey. And when we make it, it makes that mucilaginous thing. That also has that way to help cross-link the, the collagen in the tissue and make those tight gap junctions stronger. Um, butyrate we talked about, which is a product of the um, short-chain fatty acids from the fiber and the interaction with the microbiota, creating the, that material that then stabilizes the gut lining. Seaweeds, they have that slimy, you know, the seaweeds have that mucopolysaccharide, that thick lining, that slime on them. That's also really helpful in the fucoidins. I think you're going to see that these things are going to start coming up, like seaweeds in more of these digestive formulas that combine a lot of these things that are like gut soothing, where they put in the glutamine, they put in the slippery elm and the marshmallow, and they put in some okra, and they put in all these different components to try to soothe the gut. I think we'll see some of these fucoidins because there's more research coming out now. Um, probiotics, of course, to help control the ecosystem, make it more friendly and homeostatic, and then anti-inflammatory herbs, because inflammation is going to be one of the big promoters of the leaky gut, because you saw those pictures, when the thing gets inflamed, then that's when everything starts to change. It's inflammation is like, we would call it in Chinese medicine, maybe there's some damp heat in the ecosystem, there's some dampness there, turbidity, that might be inflammatory stuff. Those things cause problems in the immune system, problems in the bugs, problems in the mucus lining, it leads to problems at the lumen, and then you get the tight gap junctions expanding. So getting rid of the inflammation, berberine-rich plants, turmeric, and salicylates. Um, they're all really helpful in that way. So demulcents I mentioned, how do you maintain the mucus layer? Slippery on marshmallow, licorice, and, and especially the deglycerizinated licorice, which is not, it has, doesn't have the glycerizic acid, so it has no issues with what we talked about before with the hyperaldosteronism and none of that problem. It's just the gooey stuff in the licorice. That's really helpful. DGL is great for the gut. Aloe powder. Aloe also is strong against biofilms. It also has anti-biofilm activities. So when you give someone some of this stuff, you know, like it's really good for them on many levels. They're like harmonizers for the mucus layer and the, and the microbiota. And whole psyllium seed, another one for that gelatinous material helps to strengthen the mucus layer. Here's some stuff for breaking up biofilms. Um, aloe, comifera, buswellia, garlic, hydrastis, achillea, and hypericum. These are all plants that have scientific research modern that all shows that they are able to break up biofilms because, you know, biofilms have become a big topic of conversation, especially in the naturopathic community around um, how you deal with infections, especially like Lyme disease in that realm. Uh, mycoplasms and, and biofilms have become a target because even if you're using high doses of antibiotics, you often can't even touch these bugs because they're just in these big colonies of this slimy material that protects them from anything we do. But the, these actually, a lot of these plant compounds we have actually will go in and break up the material and expose the bugs back into their planktonic forms and allow whatever other herbs and things you're using to kill them, you allow your immune system to target them, or if you were trying to do antibiotics, it would work, make them work a lot better too. And that's one of the things is all these plants synergize with antibiotics really well too. For people who are like, I'm definitely doing antibiotics, you can make their antibiotics work better. Some traditional plantain, Baptisia enthusia and Althea, stuff that's just doesn't have like actual scientific research on it. Some of the stuff is coming from um, Mr. Bergner. So some therapies for H. pylori I want to throw in here so you guys have this. Um, always do zinc. Zinc's really good for healing the mucus layer, for, especially in the gastric tissue. Mastic gum, which comes from the mastic tree, that's a, the, the resin from that tree. Um, that's when you dose that one pretty high, and I just always do that with, with H. pylori. Bismuth, which that's actually from Pepto-Bismol. I just put that up there because it actually kills H. pylori, funny enough. Um, Berberine-rich plants, we talked about those a few times. Hydrochloric acid, again, and sometimes giving betaine or else using apple cider vinegar to stimulate betaine. Apple cider vinegar, I didn't mention, I don't think in this talk at all, maybe just like just in fermented foods, but it's actually one of the only things I know of, although I keep hearing about celery juice and I haven't seen that work, but other ways to stimulate hydrochloric acid that are real specific to stimulate those parietal cells to make HCL would be to use apple cider vinegar and I'll do a tablespoon before each meal and it just starts to get that going. Some people don't find it as effective as just like giving them betaine hydrochloride. 
and I'll talk about betaine in a minute here, but some people also say that celery juice will generate more hydrochloric acid. I know that apple cider vinegar works for a lot of people because I've had a lot of folks come in with the picture of the, the, I've got the you know, acid regurge, the heartburn, and I just I need, to, I need to treat it, and I treat it with either apple cider vinegar or betaine hydrochloride. Those are my two main ways to go, is to build the acid in their bodies when they're having heartburn and acid regurge, and I'm going to hit that in a minute. Here it is. So the difference between the two patterns of acid regurgitation and heartburn, generally, you also have the liver overacting issue because when the liver overacts on the spleen and stomach, oftentimes the spleen and stomach energy, which is supposed to descend down and take all the digestive materials, move them down through the body, starts to move upward, and that's when the, the muscle energy is pushing up and you get the hiatal hernia, and the acid that's in the stomach comes upward. That's a problem, and that's the problem for most people that you're going to see that complain of heartburn and acid regurgitation. They're going to be complaining of those symptoms as though they have too much acid, but in reality, they don't have enough acid because the acid isn't there to digest their food. So their food is literally fermenting in their stomach, and the whole system is being inhibited. The trigger, the, 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 the buildup of like, hey, here comes the fire to signal everything else down the line to, to work isn't working very well, so everything slows down, their transit slows down. There's still acid there, it's still a very low pH stomach, and when that acid bubbles up in the fermentation process and moves upward, it starts to burn the esophagus. And that feels like heartburn, and it is. But oftentimes, more often than not, if the person gets that symptom after they eat a meal, they eat food and they get the heartburn, that's the person who needs more acid. So you can give them the apple cider vinegar, the tablespoon before each meal, some people just a teaspoon, some people who are sensitive. And of course, if you're going to have them take it straight, wash their mouth out, don't let it sit on their teeth. If that's what they do right before a meal, they're going to eat and they're not going to have, you know, eating their enamel with vinegar. But some people will need a little bit less. They can use like a teaspoon. And sometimes I have people do a little bit of water with that apple cider vinegar and then a little bit of lemon. And it'll just taste a little better and they can kind of sip it and then eat it, do it with their meal. It'll stimulate hydrochloric acid production. Um, the betaine hydrochloric acid solution, though, is the betaine HCL, it's TMG, trimethylglycine from beets, is bound to hydrochloric acid so that it's not damaging. Because if you try to put hydrochloric acid right in your mouth or swallow it, it's going to be burning you really bad. So it's bound to the TMG, which makes it mild. And you can take it in and get it down into the digestive tract where it interacts with other HCL, and then it gets freed up. When that happens, you get hydrochloric acid present in the, in the stomach. And it triggers the rest of the alimentary canal, and it digests your food better. The way you dose it is that you start with one cap or tab before each meal, and they're either like 300 or 600 milligram tabs, and then you slowly increase it by one tab before each meal. Now, of course, like I said, if you think the person has an ulcer, you're going to want to protect that ulcer first. You've got to heal the ulcer first. You don't want to give them a bunch of acid if they have an ulcer. Okay? But most people do really great on this regimen. You build up their acid, and you keep building it one tab with each meal, just right before they eat. And at some point, they'll get a little warmth, a little, oh, God, I feel something in my stomach. I feel like this heat. And when that happens, you back it down to one less, and that's their maintenance dose. And some people are great at two or three tabs. I've had people need 14 before each meal. But that's the first time they didn't have bloating and gas in like 10 years. The question is, yeah. We've got to be careful because sometimes the PPIs can have a little rebound because you've been suppressing those parietal cells for so long and then suddenly it's like whoosh, it comes back on. So you kind of want to, you don't just go right to the hydrochloric acid. It can be a little too much for their, their system. It's a, it'd be a gradual thing. I'd see how they do first. Yeah, I would want to soothe their gut lining at the same time and you could bring in some betaine or start with some apple cider vinegar or something like that. Wait, last slide. Let me finish the last slide. Just want to say laughter is so good, right? And this is like one of those things where, you know, like the, there's like a, a kingdom, you know, and they've got the, the jesters, and they're all eating dinner. And they always had laughter during dinner. And it was like, what a cool medical concept. Like, back in, you know, these days in the Renaissance, whatever, they would actually, like, induce laughter during their meals because did they know it was good for digestion? I don't know. It was good for them. It made them happy anyway. So there we go. We made it through the slides. That's great. Cool. You're so welcome.